Welcome to the South Burlington School Board meeting. And I will start with comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda. Is it? Hi, uh, my name is Noah Everett. I'm the, one of the co-presidents of the South Burlington Educators Association. Um, and we came here tonight as the year comes to a close to try and advocate for things in South Burlington to go a little differently. So over the past week, I've been talking to our, our members and we were looking at what was going on with statewide health care. And so we've brought some letters that we've had signed by our members trying to encourage that process to kind of get back started. And I'm happy that it has, but also to come to a completion. The experience of 2018 and the lack of reliable health care and reimbursement for that health care was really detrimental to our ability to do our jobs. We really feel that as we enter into this contract cycle, which will go over yet another health care shift, that we owe it to our members and also to our community to do this as best we can. Um, we don't feel that a disruption is necessary, and the SBA is prepared to commit that barring an imposition by the school board of working conditions that we will not have a strike vote until the health care situation is settled statewide. Um, in the past, these negotiations have been contentious, and it is our important message to you that we don't view that as a neutral factor that we view you as our leaders and our advocates for public education in the city of South Burlington, and we are proud of the work that we do and the work that you do and are going to be doing tonight on behalf of us all. So it is our hope that this cycle can be different than the cycles have been in the past and that we can commit to working together to find a settlement that uh, respects both parties, both publicly and um, for the work. Thanks for taking the time to listen to us. We have the letters. Um, and we're going to made packets for each of you. Um, it is academic awards night just across the parking lot, so we have people who are going to need to go out, and it's also essentially the busiest time of year as we're trying to sum up. So although we are showing up here in mass, we do uh, want to release people to go back and, and do the work they need to prepare for tomorrow and for CAP week and the end of elementary school, whatever that looks like. <laughs> so thank you for taking the time to listen to us. Can I clarify something, Noah? You, you were kind of blending local contract negotiations with statewide health care. Sure. It, it, can you just summarize the, the letter we have here? Sure. So the letter was written when there appeared to be a stalling in the statewide contract negotiations because of a disagreement between the Vermont NEA and other members and um, the school board's association team. Um, it's my understanding that those negotiations, although they stalled out, have actually resumed. And so what we are hoping is to really stress the idea that being able to have reliable health care is really important. And we were hoping that as you are members of the Vermont School Boards Association that you could encourage them to get that negotiation done. The reality for us locally is that we could be seeing our fourth TPA, third party administrator, in two and a half years. Our experience with the first two TPAs was really, really bad. So it's incumbent on us to make sure that those really important decisions are thoughtful and, and happen as best as possible. Does that make sense? And then the second letter is a letter that we just are providing for you because it was run in the other paper a couple weeks ago, and we had more signatures than they print. Oh, I understand. Okay, so we've so it's really. The lo it's local negotiations and it's the statewide health care that we have two communications on. And, and as you know, our local negotiations take into account the changeover for statewide health care because that will happen during this negotiating cycle. Okay. Um, thank you. We'll take a look at these. I, I do want to, we do have a, uh, an agenda item on negotiations update, so I might have anticipated this, but I'm happy to accommodate people who have schedules and other things to go to. Um, you know, I, I wear two hats in that I am on the negotiations committee on the statewide side. Um, and I can let you know we had a good information session yesterday as a collective group. Um, we do have an outstanding issue on following the law as legislators implemented in statute. Um, and that is remains an outstanding issue. And we hope that it can be resolved um, amicably soon. Um, and on the local side, you know, um, uh, 
we, the board is disappointed, as you seem to be as well, that there continue to be some delays on getting this. You, you know, Noah, more than most, that we tried to address this up front in ground rules. And at this point, um, I'll, I will have an update on the agenda for those in the public that are going to remain for this item. But we have fact finding scheduled for July 9th. And that will largely mean that we do not have a fact finding report that's compliant with the current contract and that we will enter the new school year without a, an agreement because of that. So our hope is that we can do that quickly and that um, we can really see some movement to get toward a, a, an agreement. And I think, I think all of you know um, that the health care terms are the same as the last two years in this one-year contract. And um, we have a wage proposal that's above CPI. And not to get into the details, but we are, you know, committed to work hard, um, get through fact finding, and get to an agreement, preferably before the start of the year. But the timing of that fact finding meeting is, is going to impact that. Um, I, I understand the the board's position on this, and I would just highlight that it is the board who decided to declare impasse and decided that fact finding <coughs> was needed when we did not think so. Um, we had a mediated session where we hoped to make progress, and that didn't happen. Um, the concept that the health care is the same when we know that it's going to change to statewide over the bridge of this and the issue that in this current year, we still have people who haven't had reimbursement from 2018 who now owe the district money. And at this point, in my understanding, there's been no ability to actually negotiate or even talk about how that could be mitigated in the future as far as how people can make sure they get reimbursement. We also just found out in 2019 that FSA money will be embargoed for the first quarter of the year so people will not be able to access that money for their health care. So although I think that there can be a narrative about uh, timeliness, in this case we have extenuating circumstances that I think mean we should get the information we need to have an a settable deal that is consistent with the values that I think we actually share, which is quality health care, quality education, and a quality experience for South Burlington parents and families. So I, I do appreciate that. Appreciate that, Noah. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a good end of the year. <laughs> all right, any other comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda? All right, seeing none. Um, do we have any amendments to the agenda, we do. David? Yep. So I'm going to uh, amend um, under my report the school bus security cameras mm -hmm. and 2.1, which is item number 12. Um, I need a little more time to, to discern that. Okay. So, um, for so, folks. so we're taking it off the yeah, agenda? Yeah, that, okay. that that's my recommendation. We'll put it back on for the 19th. And I think that was it. So the school bus camera one that was in your packet uh, and item 12 are both off. Um, is there a separate? Oh, school yeah, bus camera a, off of your report. Got yeah, it. right. Okay. I just wanted to point to where those two documents were. Okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, we'll move on to announcements. And before Cole gets started, he does have to take leave to actually sing at the awards banquet, correct? That is correct. And then he said he's coming back. And then you're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> That's dedication. <laughs> so um, to start off at the high school, today was the senior barbecue that was out over in the senior lot, and there was a bouncy castle to what I heard. Um, <laughs> as, thought? It looked like it was yeah. about to fall down. <laughs> part, part of the light earlier today. I thought, wow, they're, that's getting some use. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, as mentioned, Academic Awards Night is tonight, and it's happening right now, which, as once again, as mentioned, will be why I'm leaving briefly for a few minutes. Um, Today was the final day of classes at the high school, and tomorrow starts our culminating activity period, a time for final assessments that are typically um, other than the standard test. So projects, presentation speeches, things like of that sort. Um, graduation is next Friday at St. Michael's College at 10 a.m. All Sports Awards Night was Thursday, May 30th. Our girls' tennis team made it to the state championships and, play and are playing this afternoon. Our girls lacrosse team also made the state championships and will be playing June 8th at UVM at 2. Um, congrats to Tess Lalonde, Daria noonan Waymeyer, and Asya Begovic of Syzygy Studios for winning Best Overall Film at the 50-Hour Film Festival. 
Um, it'll be presented tonight at Academic Awards Night, but I'm happy to announce that the South Burlington High School Student Council Teacher of the Year is Christina Toner. Um, at the middle school, the 7th and 8th grade band concert was this Monday. Tuttle Fest, a day of community service, was last Friday. Um, the elementary schools will have an early release tomorrow. And at Central School, Tuesday, June 18th, is Rick Marcotte Central School Night at the Ballpark, where a portion of the Lake Monsters ticket sales will go towards the Rick Marcotte Central School PTO. So if you can make it, awesome. Um, and then the last day of school is June 14th, and the first day of school for next year will be August 26th, 2019. <laughs> nice job, Cole. That's great. <laughs> you're, you're doing extra duty with that, Arnell, huh? <laughs> and now your voice is all warmed up. So <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> Great. The only thing I would add is um, there was um, yesterday was a project search graduation, and so we, as you know, we have, are the sponsor of the of the program, and um, where students are integrated into uh, internship jobs, um, opportunities, at the hospital, uh, in hospitality. And that graduation was yesterday, and again, just a great, great um, example of helping all, all of our students be successful. And so that was uh, well attended by hospital folks and staff and some of their <coughs> core leaders. And um, again, uh, the Secretary of uh, Human Services spoke and the, the President of uh, the hospital spoke. And again, it was a really, a really nicely attended and, and uh, really positive event. Great. Any other announcements? Um, I would share with the board that the board is invited to attend graduation at St. Mike's on the 14th, mm -hmm. um, and David arranges for some seating. optimal seating, mm -hmm. so we get to see every grad go across that stage. And I, I did, think, and I did reach out last week to Delina and Meg just about what time if people want to be there. So graduation starts at 10. Meg had said it would be good if board members are coming if they're there by 9, because that's when doors open and yeah. people start to arrive. So. It gets a little bit hectic within the last 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So certainly, you know, 9, 9, 10, 9, 15. Mm -hmm. Parking is usually pretty good, but, you know, it, you may have to be parking a little bit away mm -hmm. on the grass. And depending on the weather conditions, we hope, you know, <laughs> it could be a little bit of a, a, a wetter walk, too, in the grass. Yeah, I will, I will say from having done this a few years now um, that for those of you who – had pretty cramped hands signing about 200 diplomas. It's a nice culminating event to put a name to a face and realize most of these kids have been in our system for mm -hmm. over 12 years in so many cases, uh, most cases actually, and uh, to really s hear where they're going on to and, mm -hmm. and uh, see the families and guardians and so forth that have supported them along the way. All right. Uh, agenda item six, city and school collaboration. So one uh, out of the gate, it looks like we're, we're a go for the 18th uh, for a steering committee meeting at 6.30. Uh, that meeting will be at the city. Um, and again, our, the purpose of the steering committee meeting is for both the school board and city council folks to come together and talk about, you know, relevant issues. Obviously one which certainly has been on the forefront has been the stormwater conversation related to the 180 Market Street and conveyance of land. Um, I'm sure there'll be an update up about that there as well um, and other pertinent things that are happening both city and school has been our focus. We have not yet set the agenda so we'll, we'll be working on that but uh, just wanted to make you aware of that. And the other part is uh, just to do a brief update on um, where we are with with the stormwater um, and when we last met uh, I think a week ago this past Tuesday um, for an early morning uh, warned meeting uh, the board uh, did uh, reach agreement and part of that agreement um, also included some addendum language and currently um, the attorney our attorney David Rue is working uh, to um, get that information and pro has provided that information to a uh, city attorney and will be working through the addendum language to um, provide clarity and kind of expectation on how we move forward. There's a few other points and Elizabeth, I don't want to take all of that, but other yeah, things I th you may want to mention. I think one of the key points um, in the addendum and kind of feedback to the district is, is um, really clarity on when construction will occur. So I think the, um, uh, I, 
my understanding is there's agreement that the school property won't be disrupted till at the end of school year next year, um, but that the access to the school property vis-a-vis -vis the easement that was granted to the city um, will likely see some disruption uh, this fall, uh, if not before, and that one of the one of the big um, challenges I think that both the city and school district has is understanding the the timeline of when there will be disruption, being able to communicate with parents and staff about kind of access to the property and safety issues associated with that. Um, so that that is at the forefront of a lot of the. Um, uh, district concerns right now um, in terms of short-term disruption and then as we plan for next summer too. Um, and Tom, since you're in the audience, uh, one of the things I know I read in the other paper, kind of a synopsis of the council meeting, and not to belabor the point, but it sounded like there was a pretty robust discussion about stormwater um, at the council meeting. and. I know that I was not informed or given the opportunity to attend, <laughs> and nor was David. So consistent with our last two steering committees, if you can take a message back, um, or at least hear the message, part of our goal coming out of steering committee was to improve communication, and that would have been a great opportunity to reinforce the action taken by the board on Tuesday. So, thank you for allowing me to share that. <laughs> Uh, anything else from a stormwater standpoint? No, I don't think so. I, I think this comes at a time when we know that at Rick Marcotte currently there's been a fair amount of disruption. So I think it, there's some heightened awareness of, of potential disruptions on currently what's happening at Market Street. And um, the positive side of this will be is that Market Street will be done. So that will <coughs> allow for better flow through traffic, albeit we're going to have some continued distractions. Um, in and around our property, although we hope less than what we have actually have experienced recently. Um, again, I think the city and, and Gary and his staff have been working hard to make sure that, you know, it can be as open and as available as possible. I don't know anything you want to add, it, kind of on the horizon of stormwater work, current current realities. Um, no, uh, I, I think um, I think the the collaborative process improved greatly over the last. Um, you know, 30 days, and you know, looks like looks like a good plan, and and the communication and access to Rick Marcotte has also improved greatly over the last couple of weeks. But it's been it's it's notable that it's been rough. I mean, when you take a major a major uh, road out of the equation with the num <clears throat> amount of traffic, I, we want to absolutely recognize that you know, parents and guardians and community members have been extremely understanding. Um, while at the same time, we recognize it's not been easy. You know, the road has had some major potholes as a result of the increased traffic. It's had delays uh, in and out, and it has been difficult for certainly our parents, guardians, staff, community members uh, that use that facility. It's not been easy. So again, I just want to recognize that and also say thank you to folks for being patient and, you know, considerate. Yeah, I just also though, I do want to clarify that it's better it's still not good <laughs> and mm, and it is <laughs> it is still challenging and i really feel like going into next school year we need to have a plan as a district to communicate with parents at least on a weekly basis and regardless of what the city chooses to do with regard to communication we need to be taking information that we get from the city and letting parents know what to expect and what to plan <clears throat> for and not just parents staff as well i mean uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is, you know, I've heard from, you know, more than one staff person, staff are trapped there during the day because their breaks are short enough and the delays are mm. so unclear when they're going to happen. I know from experience going in to think I'm going to drop something off in five minutes and be back out of there, sometimes it takes five or ten minutes to get in and it takes another five or ten minutes to get out, mm. depending on what the trucks are doing. That means for a staff person who has a 30-minute lunch, they mm -hmm. cannot do anything during that lunch. They are trapped on that site. And so it, it is a real change for, you know, what they're used to in terms of work. And we have to be better as a district about um, communicating with people what they can expect, whether it's good, whether it's bad, you know, improving or not. We just need to be clear with people. Okay. Any other comments? 
Tom. <laughs> so as a, as a resident and a parent of Rick Marcotte, Tom Chittenden, um, one of the teachers recently commented how they would love to be able to get in and out of the property from the Williston Road exit. Mm -hmm. So is that something that we wanted to advocate for this coming fall? I'd definitely love to hear the school board's uh, yeah, it can, that came up. At, I don't think you were able to attend the meeting Tuesday, and it, it kind of came up in the context of understanding exactly what the shift of the access road was going to be and what the alternatives were. Um, and the, the consensus is that use of that side road off Williston might be possible, but it's going to be one way, and it's either right turns out or right turns in off of Williston Road. So that will that is a part of a potential solution, but I guess I'd say it's only part of it, um, and I, I think it's under consideration. Thanks. Anything else? All right. We'll move on to the superintendent's report. So I have a couple... Oh, that break to get my coffee? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was going <laughs> to right. do that for you. But. So um, the um, we're going to shift to talk a little bit here for a second about the Chamberlain noise um, <laughs> matter and um, actually by your place I think is a, a document that Gary actually prepared for me giving you some kind of an update so it's by your place um, first I think it's pretty it's known that the the new NEMs came out um, actually last week um, and they had a, a showing which I attended they had set that up in the upper deck of the airport and had folks from the FAA there uh, where you could move around and see your affected community from Winooski to Williston to South Burlington, um, Burlington obviously, and you could see how it, the new noise exposure, so NEM stands for noise exposure map, and um, they were providing what the result is uh, based on the expectation, the arrival of the F-35, the, the newer aircraft. On that same day, I'll note that uh, the F-35 was in route uh, to Europe and, and because of a refueling problem um, and bad weather, wherever the refueling was happening, they, they actually needed to stop here in, in Burlington at the airport. So there was four F-35s on the <coughs> far side of the uh, airport on that particular night. Um, so um, the, the noise exposure maps are currently out, and again, I've provided uh, the board um, by your place as well. This this map, I think there's maybe some others around. Again, there's a whole lot in the report. Here is the draft, um, you know, noise exposure map. So it's got a ton of information, in it, including all kinds of additional <coughs> tables around, you know, things that you often don't think about around, you know, traffic patterns that happen between exiting aircraft, run-up aircraft. So there's a whole bunch of additional information in here about the tables, about other um, avenues of how noise is created or what the effects it might have. But just looking at this particular map, the one that's, again, by your place, you see the years, if you can look at the boxes. So the outer band happens to be the 2015 65 decibel level. And then the 2013 going in, the 2023, and then the 2018. So these are all 65, So which means everything inside those lines are louder, right? Everything outside is obviously better. So just thinking about the net effect, um, when the line moves in, right, it means that it's, it's, a, it's, a, better, it's a better situation. So in 2018, the line was closer into the airport. That was the 65 line. Then you're moving out to the 2023. 20, it moves out, so it's getting louder. It got louder. It was louder in 2013 and louder in 2015. Does that make sense? I think what, so this is the average? So these are, the day. again, there's a whole lot of information with this, but the, the, the acronym of DNL is the day night level. Yeah. Averaged over okay. a 24 hour period. Over 24 hours. So this map does not account for what really what we're really concerned about, which is takeoffs and landings of F-16s and F-35s. Well, it takes it into account, averaged in a 24 oh, hour it, period. It averages it in with almost complete silence in the middle of the night when very few planes are taking off and landing, so it makes it look better than it is. Yep, that's correct. But that again, that's so, that's. So really, this, this, I mean, this information is useless to us. We don't have. We need to know 
what it's like when, when a plane, when an when a F-16 or F-35 takes off and lands, not how it averages with the nighttime when the noise is crickets. Well, there are different, there are different um, standards used for different things, Alex. So we did some testing of our own mm -hmm. about what the F-16 yeah. sound actually is in the building when the F-16s are taking off. Jones Payne then did another study that tested how well the building mitigates noise currently um, by doing different sounds through the walls, through the mm -hmm. windows, that kind of thing. This is how the FAA does its work. Mm -hmm. This is the map that they use. This is the this, this standard that they use when they do grant funding. So it's useful to us in that we need to understand where the FAA believes we are and what eligibility then we have for mitigation from them. Yeah, well, if, 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 if this is used to determine eligibility, then that that's one thing, but um, which it is, which I'll, I'll yeah, get to yeah. that. Yeah, and that that's the problem. It's it it doesn't it doesn't tell the true story. It it is not the sort of situational. It, right. Right. it doesn't everything. give you the yeah. incidental. The and event, again, when yeah. we did our own assessments, obviously, as Bridget said, we we evaluated what the the level was when the the F sixteen or any commercial traffic was taking off, including yeah. also when kids were going out to recess and those yeah. levels too, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, it took all that into account. Um, so what I, I wanted. Just, can I just clarify mm -hmm. one thing? So what we're saying is, it got better in 2018 from 13 and 15, mm -hmm. and the 2023 expectation is it gets worse. Correct. And um, again, you can say slightly, little, big, whatever. I don't know the right quantifiable. But now we're fully inside the line, is mm -hmm. what this is saying. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other, the other thing I heard is that the contours, well, this map doesn't show it, but the contours show some improvement to sound levels in homes in South Burlington, uh, but that Winooski and Williston were more adversely affected. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm not, you know, I, I would, I would hesitate for me to personally comment on that because I, you know, my, my view is that the homes now in between here yeah. are right. now are now right. eligible, right? Versus yeah. the outside. So again, and I'm I'm way outside my my comfort level and knowledge base on that, but that would be my quick piece. But for us, what this means is is that we remain eligible for all of the grant app, the sound mitigation grants that are available. And again, Gary's done a nice job. Um, again, the day after the the, the maps went out, um, the FAA and Jones Payne had made an appointment to be at Chamberlain that next morning. Um, and you see the folks that were there along with Gary and some of his staff. And this was a summary discussion and I'm happy to, maybe Gary, you can just go through the bullet points and then seek any questions from board members on what's there, but. Yes, uh, um, it was a positive meeting, very collaborative. Um, the, the summary of the discussion are they're laid out pretty clearly. The new um, NEM, the noise exposure map, doesn't impact um, the current um, Chamberlain Elementary School eligibility for grant funding. Um, we still qualify for a positive ventilation system in the eligible areas of the school. That primarily means um, classroom areas, teaching areas. Um, so what a positive ventilation system means to the FAA is, is a new um, heating and cooling system in those qualifying areas of Chamberlain Elementary. Um, L and N will be, they'll be designing and scoping um, potential solutions for a positive ventilation system at Chamberlain Elementary over the next like 60 to 90 days. Um, we will receive those for, for input and comment along with the airport um, and the FAA through Jones Payne. Um, that solution will, will be like a, a heat pump type solution, either with probably most likely um, water sourced or air sourced. Um, honestly, I personally have some concerns about air, air sourced um, heat pumps because of the extreme cold that we sometimes get um, in Vermont. Some of the research I've done says below, you know, 20 below zero that those struggle um, uh, in that kind of a climate. So we, we will have some input. We can take a look at the at LNN's analysis and design work. And um, 
and kind of uh, be able to have input. So we did discuss that there could be other funding sources. That this is just for your information, uh, absolutely no guarantee, um, but there are other potential funding sources outside of the FAA for non-qualifying areas um, of the school, the uh, gymnasium, the office space that's in Chamberlain Elementary, uh, potentially funding um, through uh, collaboration with our congressional delegation, um, maybe work with the Department of Defense, um, those kind of options. We could also choose to, if those options didn't prove viable, we could we could choose to pick up some of that additional space cost ourselves to have a complete system in the whole building. Um, the grant funding does cover 90% of eligible costs. Um, the re remaining 10%, according to uh, the representative from the FAA, would traditionally come from the sponsor, the airport. Um, there was no mention in our discussion of a, a local district type of funding or a city of South Burlington type of augmented 10% funding. Um, so the next steps are the, the energy audit is being done, the design work is being done over the next 60 and 90 days to 90 days. Um, they'll select an option and we have input. I don't think we have the final say, um, but we have input. Um, and they'll prepare for a public bid request um, by December of 2019. They'll award uh, to, the, to a contractor after the closing of the bid period. And then the grant funding application is due to the FAA mid-April of 2020. And the grant approval window um, opens May 1st, 2020. So follow up. Um, I've sent these same notes to, to Jones Payne and, and the LNN rep um, to make sure that they're accurate, that there are no inconsistencies or any misunderstandings from, from our meeting. Um, we will also um, do some research with uh, and have, um, hopefully John Klesch will help us um, with understanding uh, the FAA application approval funding process. Uh, because one of the things that I, I was a, a little, I, I couldn't follow up during the meeting, but it didn't sound like the project start date was contingent on FAA approval of the grant application. And it, that concerned me a little because I'm not sure what that, what that really means to us. So we're doing some follow up um, with our attorneys to try, try to figure that piece out. Do you yeah. um, one is what would be the time frame for us to understand when work would take place? Because I'm thinking about contingency planning for what we do with the kids while this work is happening because we've been led to believe previously that this is a big enough project. It can't be done in eight weeks. So, uh, so yeah. that's, a, that's a great question. So um, I asked that question to Derek, from the lead um, engineer from LNN, and and he was optimistic that, you know, if we um, got the approval process, that that they have had success in the past starting a project that did prep work over for a school that did prep work over Christmas break, February break, April break, a groundbreaking uh, the day after school got out completion in the week prior to school starting up again. Okay. So he was uh, optimistic that it's possible. If it wasn't, uh, David has kind of charged me with, with coming up with some alternatives um, to, to work with the shoulder seasons that our windows are often open at Chamberlain Elementary School through, um, through a temporary design of uh, portable cooling, um, a portable cooling system in, in the most effective classrooms there. Mm -hmm. So we're, take, we're gonna be taking a look, Bart and I will be taking a look at how we can uh, accomplish that. Um, we could get lucky, we won't count on that and have a season like this where we wouldn't require mm -hmm. the windows to be open during those shoulder seasons, but, but we will prepare um, to mitigate disruption. Um, we have also 
preliminarily engaged a little bit um, with with the with the National Guard in Vermont to to socialize and to get them thinking about if they'd be willing to be a partner in helping us mitigate that if it's even possible to adjust flying schedules um, during this during the shoulder seasons of the school year okay. and then my other question was about funding and I think you answered it a little bit by saying that maybe we we might be able to manage without temporary classrooms or my question was whether grant funding would take into account project costs as opposed to just or, or like um, actual you know completion costs like we talked about with our bigger project yeah. you know it's very different you know things on a project by project basis versus the complete cost of you know moving kids if we have to you know all those kinds of things they would will. that be included in it the will. grant application the, okay the grant funding will be based on on LNN's design and project schedule so okay. if there are project costs um, mm -hmm. for temporary housing included in that um, design and project proposal then the FAA grant would would um, cover that okay and the representative from the FAA seemed pretty confident that the 10% would come from the airport because that seems different from what I heard in that letter that came from ah. Gene Richards, right? <laughs> yes, I, I can't assess his confidence level. Yeah. <laughs> but we had I mean, that's a, part of our, our due diligence is yeah. to and recognize that this grant is, has been and, and probably will continue to be awarded in many other parts of the country and to use examples of how that is deployed. And um, yeah. we're I, pretty consistent that it shouldn't, we shouldn't be bearing um, you right. know, that, that, that level of burden. And, and I tried to use the words in my notes that he used when I asked the question. Right. <laughs> but the traditionally, I think, okay. is a qualifying statement. So, <laughs> okay. So Gary touched a little bit on you know kind of the contingency component. I think again, um, appropriately. And the other thing that we know or we don't really know is when the complement of aircraft are actually scheduled to come. We know that they were initially scheduled in September. Mm -hmm. We know now that that's delayed. Um, we also know that when they do get here, they're going to be. Um, likely unavailable to fly because they have to be uh, folks that are going to maintain them have to spend a pretty pretty significant amount of time learning how to maintain them so there's there's some added time and so that also I think goes to the timeline issue for us and also again not fully understanding the implications and the sound uh, implications you know we feel like we have have that uh, underhand Good. No other questions? Everything's silent on noise? Good. Thanks. <laughs> Good follow-up. Yeah. Um, MTSS specialization at the elementary. Um, I, you know, again, information went out. Uh, I know I sent it to board members. Um, also went out through administrators to staff and uh, to parents and guardians as well. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm certainly happy to take questions. I think one of the things that I you know, there's always um, opportunities for improvement around communication. And I think, you know, one of the things that I recognize that, you know, although we've we talked about the implementation of the law, uh, Act 173, I never really did a good job of providing kind of the context of, of rationale and reason. And um, many of you heard over the over the years around the change in um, the change in um, the special ed funding model under Act 173. Again, you know it's, it's slightly delayed. I think this document does provide some, uh, you know, more robust language around our work and our um, pathways around uh, our MTSS work um, and provide some context that, you know, should have actually accompanied um, some of the correspondence. And so, again, I just want to make that available to you. So, um, we're going to talk in a bit about our, our continuous improvement plan and um, you know we're consistent with um, what I've said in the in the in the in the letter uh, that we continue to work to ensure that all students are um, working to a level of success and we're looking at that so a lot of the training that you'll see in our professional development our CIP plan you'll you'll see there so I'm certainly happy to take feedback um, um, answer any questions that folks have. Um, does, Elizabeth, did you have questions? Well, you, to go it, first uh, you know, I had a chance to talk with David earlier, um, 
and one of my comments on the um, letter that went out regarding specialization mm -hmm. is I did I was not in attendance at a meeting when there was a second conversation that kind of resulted in the the pause associated with implementation but I I went back to the meeting I was in attendance at and some of the um, deliverables from that were really focused on where's the research that supports mm -hmm. the recommendation um, how does this address the achievement gap and uh, and is it is it the only program is it the preferred whatever so it was it's been described and maybe this this mm -hmm. will lend some out information there but also kind of um, what's the anticipated outcome of implementing that um, and and that's tied with this achievement gap but also what's the baseline of achievement gap I don't think we really heard that so uh, I'm based on my participation in the first meeting I'm still looking for the research that supports the recommendation of the specialization model within the school so um, I don't know if that was discussed or, but I, 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 I know I don't have it and I haven't seen it yet no. yeah so I don't I don't think deliberately it was not and again I think part of my my restart here is just to make sure board members are aware of the legislation that you know that's in play around 173 um, specific to um, you know enhancing the effectiveness and availability for for improved outcomes for all kids uh, the changing of the, edu the funding model for special education uh, again some of the grounded work both quantitative quantitative and uh, qualitative around the DMG report and that it was piloted so th there's a lot in here in the legislative component that really began our, our work back you know not much after the 18 uh, when this uh, first came out was to begin to really or continue to dig into our MTSS work uh, and also begin to work to comply with the legislative the, le 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 the legislative um, Act 173 that was um, out can, there can you help me on that David because I'm trying to link um, special ed funding with specialization so in the previous model of, it, of uh, special ed funding um, you had to write a service plan, and the service plan was written specific for students, right? Mm -hmm. The change to the f in the in the in the legislation has been that now it's going to go to a block grant. So you have a, an amount of money, and you need to be able to serve all students. Obviously, you can't forget about the students that are most in need. But that funding stream, uh, that funding methodology is different. Therefore, under Act 173, they're specifically making sure that you're meeting all of these required gates that are that are a part of um, what they believe is a critical part of educating all students so again uh, you know there's some it goes in I think it does a decent job to provide the background and rationale um, again it goes into that current funding model that I you know just briefly shared shared with you um, you know it talks more about how funding special education will change again looking at serving all students how the delivery um, will change and looking at you know from individual IEPs to how that begins to happen it also addresses that you're trying to put individuals that are the most skilled with individuals that need the most support um, versus what we not not just not us only but in general we've put sometimes the individuals that are most in need with some of the least very nice people but sometimes the least qualified so um, a pretty critical part of, of, of our work has been this to identify and close that achievement gap as we've looked at our own data as I said in some of those meetings we have not been able to significantly close that gap for our students that are not meeting those standards we, we again we have formative assessments that we've also used our data walls some of you know that uh, at our elementary levels we have both our literacy and our math <coughs> levels and those data walls certainly also depict that we're not making the gains that we need to so part of that is to re-examine and reevaluate how we're rendering that, and certainly the the backdrop or the forefront is 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 this work. And again, really heavily grounded by Act 173, MTSS, and specialization is a component of that. But it's not it's not one size fits all. It may be that two teachers choose to co-teach in a component, and then it may be that there's some differentiation that will happen um, in some cases. It may be that I'll be all of you know math because of my level of expertise and somebody else will be a little bit different again that can be a little bit different um, as we continue to roll that out 
So as I said, you'll see a little bit here when we get to the, the CIP plan, you'll see some of this language um, is embedded in our work and there's CIP plans for every school um, based on that data. Yeah, I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling yeah, well, to see the connection. And I, I, even after, I, I don't want to jump ahead to the CIPs, but one of the statements that you made in the two previous meetings where we've talked about this is that teachers have said they would like more content-specific professional development. I did not hear from that I would like content-specific in a specific content area. What I heard you say was that they wanted more content-specific professional development versus initiatives, that there is initiative exhaustion at this point. And what I see in the CIP, uh, CIPs, all of them, is with that background of I want more content professional development, I want more of our meetings to focus on the content that I'm teaching, is, for example, in one of the schools, this is just an example of one of the schools, under safe and healthy schools, we're talking about you know, committees for self-regulation, uh, universal design for learning, PBIS, resilient learners team, responsive classroom, restorative practice. There's this whole list of initiatives that seem to be the focus of these continuous, edu or continuous improvement plans that seems to go against what I'm hearing. So I'm hearing an argument for specialization as the way to get people more content um, focused professional development, but yet it feels like the burden of a lot of these other different initiatives and pilots and all that kind of stuff is also going up and that seems in conflict to me. And so that's why I'm just, I'm really struggling why specialization is the answer. Okay. I'm, I'm also struggling with what we're gonna do to talk to parents about it because there was a pretty clear ask from parents to have a specific meeting about it because this has been embedded in in board meetings about you know our whole agenda and we've had to sort of limit our time we've talked a lot about it but we've had to also limit it and move on to other agenda items and I've not heard to me it felt like in this letter we were saying that that communication and that process for how it's actually going to look at how specialization is going to look at each school is going to be pushed down to the principal level so they're going to run different processes which to me would mean there's a big potential for different outcomes for what specialization looks like in each of the three different schools, which raised a few concerns for me. But it also sort of said to me that I, I just didn't see a clear message in here that we were going to sit down again with parents and be really clear about that answer, about why specialization is what we think will close that achievement gap. And I think that's what parents are waiting to hear um, and, and concerned about. Because otherwise it feels like you're changing the whole way we're doing things you know, and if we're focused on, you know, the special education piece of it, it feels <clears throat> like we're changing the whole way we're doing things to address a certain, um, certain subsets of school. Um, and it almost feels like we're not taking into account, you know, everyone who's doing okay in the current model. And so there needs to be a real clear message about why specialization is the right thing and that it is the right thing and that it's the right thing for all learners and that it's going to help everyone come up. Because I've just had a lot of feedback not just from from the general parent population, but from parents who are pediatricians, from parents who are child psychiatrists, from parents who are teachers in other districts, saying this doesn't seem right to me, especially at the K to two or K to three level, and for very very clear reasons. And I'm not hearing the other clear reasons on the other side why specialization is the thing. The other thing I'm not seeing in the CIPs, other than for Chamberlain, is dimension of specialization. So for looking forward to the next year for the other two elementaries, I'm not seeing a real clear focus on it. So I'm, I'm a little confused about the fact that we thought we were going to go ahead and roll this out starting in the fall um, when it just doesn't feel like we were as far down the path as we should have been if we were if we were thinking about it. So it sort of brings up the, the question of how these initiatives get started and, and, and when the right time is to bring the board and parents and those things, or, or those, those different categories of people into the process and, and what we need to have in place before things roll out. Um, so slightly jumbled comments, but mainly I'm still just not hearing the clear reason why for specialization. And I'm not saying that um, I would be against it if I heard a clear reason why. I just haven't heard a very clear reason why this is the way to go. Yeah, I think, I mean, my sense is, David, the, that the board is serving a little bit as a barometer for the community around 
the explanations not hanging together. And if I if I go back up to policy governance, which we try really hard to do sometimes, I sort of look at treatment of parents um, and guardians and and really the ends policy and say, you know, if specialization is a component of delivering on the ends, then, you know, hopefully that case can be made in that context. I don't know if this is the only policies that would apply, but then in treatment of parents and guardians and in terms of communication, um, that, that probably is the other component and inclusiveness around the, the um, uh, transition process too. So uh, even, you know, if I can just react to this, it's, it's, this looks like it's the change in the funding model is affecting how we deliver um, services to in the special ed area there's an implication there's an achievement gap there but um, it it's it's a little bit like what was the achievement gap with the prior model of service plans for this subset of students and then you know what's the expectation with the shift to the funding or the funding model of a block grant and then I, I think Bridget's comment about sort of how does it serve the subset and then does it serve the whole as well so it, my my sense is, I don't want to speak for other board members, but I think the feedback I'm hearing and I'm feeling is, I I, I wouldn't even know how to interpret this right now. I'll read through it. We just got it, but um, <clears throat> I don't well, I don't think this is the document that justifies specialization in and of itself. It's sort of another piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Well, I think it's a big part of the it's a been a big part of the the work that we do, right? Mm -hmm. We have to follow the the rules and regulations that pass down to us. You are well aware of some of the initiatives that come our way, um, and this is one, obviously, that is part of that. We have a pretty big shift in funding, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think if you read into this, you'll find out that a big reason for this change is that we were not. Um, being as effective as we could with the resources that we've been providing and this is at a state level distribution and so um, there's been a real push here to identify how we can improve um, so again I, I, I think it would be wise again this is not my writing my legislation this has been this is out there and, and has been part of our work again I think sometimes I fail to circle back with you know the the reasons and the rationales of, of why we're doing things, right? Whether it's a budgetary decision and how we're uh, making some decisions to uh, in special education mm -hmm. or or regular education. So, um, I hear what you're saying. Um, this is um, certainly parent communication and parent feedback is critical, and I've been clear about that. So, uh, we recognize that we need to reevaluate and make sure that's really clear. Um, I've chosen to not go out and create more confusion mm -hmm. before we can create clarity ourselves and you you folks being a big part of that um, and so I'm I'm hearing you at the same time I want you to hear me and that we have pretty significant achievement gaps for us although people would say no you don't you're you're, you're one of the top and I want to say we have some areas that we definitely know we need to improve and you know our data systems are not all in place but we have a lot of data. As I said, data walls, uh, behavior, um, standardized assessment, formative assessments, and we know that there's areas that we can do better. So, you know, I'm proud that we're identifying that. I think how we approach how to resolve that is in part what we're working on trying to address. And we think that, again, we're a district that has, you know, uh, we've paid individuals to go off to be highly educated and. Uh, headed off to VMI. We have um, educated folks who get master's degrees in, in mathematics um, who have a real passion. We have job, you know, coaches in literacy and math. So it's again how to, how to really best utilize um, staff to ensure that all students are, are meeting what we think. I, you know, I'd like to get to 100% or very close to it. And right now, you know, we're I generalize at kind of the 80-20, but in some cases we're a little bit better. But in a lot of cases we're not we're not there, and it's not the individuals that are identified or on IEPs. It's a good number of students that are just not not getting what they need. And so, um, a systemized approach is what we're looking at trying to do better at. I also just wanted to point out one thing that, that did bother me a little bit about this letter um, was that. 
the no. sentence that many of the parent concerns that we received were also more about our process and timing than the changes. I had a completely different interpretation of those two meetings where parents came. They expressed <laughs> concerns about timing and process as a way of slowing things down, but there is deep concern about the change itself. And so again, we just need to understand about why. About funding? You mean about no, just about, the, the about <laughs> specialization and why we think it is the right thing to close that gap. I am not an expert. I am not in this whole team that has developed this. But everything that I have read, and this is why I need you to refute it. I need you to show me research. Everything that I have read says that literacy needs to be included throughout the curriculum. It needs to be integrated. And that math, wherever it can as well, for kids who are trying to make up an achievement gap, they need to have all of those things woven throughout their curriculum at the early years. And my concern is that if we're specializing teachers and the professional development that they're getting, that kids are gonna, are gonna get short shrift. Um, on one or the other um, in in parts of their day where they could be getting more literacy instruction. You know, even in math, you know, the literacy can be drawn into that if teachers have the right professional development to do that. Um, so I'm just, I as a parent am concerned, as a board member I'm concerned that we are not listening to the actual concerns of parents, which I think um, are, are valid and, and we need to take them into account. Again, helpful feedback. I want to let you know I'm receiving it, and we need to. We're, it's important. And again, this is why I'm, I'm on the pause uh, and the reevaluation. And um, I do think this is a really good kind of base level document to reacquaint yourself with. I'm not wanting to say you haven't read it before, but um, again, this is a little little dated. I, I recognize that, but there was some fair amount of conversation about this work um, some time ago, which is part of what we're trying to conform to. Um, can I just ask, uh, that, I mean, again, we just got this, but does Act 73? 173. 173. Um, Changes the funding model. I, I understand that, but does it say specialization? It doesn't say specialization. It has some pretty, how service delivery should will change. I mean, it's, it's embedded in there. Um, and so the service delivery, again, because it's not identified through a service plan for a single student, you have a block amount of money to serve students, but it's looking to, to also make sure that it can also help individuals that are also not identified in, in that learning pool and how, how you can support all, all students, right? So it's a, the ability to use your dollars in the most effective way uh, and not necessarily in an isolated in an isolated manner. So again, there's a lot of lot of detail in here. I, I do want to say that around, you know, we want math language and, and literacy to be embedded in all content area, right? When you're solving a math problem, you gotta say how you did it. There's heavy language in it and vice versa. So we recognize that, but at the same time we want to make sure all students, whether you're have just gotten it or you're about to get it, we hope, or you're far farther advanced, that we have the individuals who have the aptitude to really help you propel to that next level and really understand your language and your problem solving methodology and be able to advance you. While still, all, all, all of our elementary are all certified in all areas, it doesn't take that away from having that conversation about your solving the problem and using your, your language to, to write about it. And again, um, so again, we think there's some opportunities there to really um, help all students. I hear what you're saying. More is needed. Uh, this is not a, a meeting necessarily to convince, yep. but for me to listen. So I'm, I'm wanting to be respectful of that. Yeah. No, good. Appreciate that. And again, you know, typically the board supports mm -hmm. the direction of administration, the recommendation. And I, I think what you're hearing at a, at a minimum, David, is that it the information that the board's getting just isn't hanging together yep. in terms of continuity and supporting the recommendation that's being made and um, if, if nothing else we're representing kind of the you're a good you're a good barometer yeah. that's exactly right I appreciate the feedback and we're gonna keep working on it well, your memo refers to soliciting parent input. right and the, and the Vermont Agency of Ed memo that you referred to talks about the engagement of the family and community members right. so this isn't just going to be coming out through newsletters right it's going to be actual meetings and seeing mm -hmm. what people think and 
Yep, and there's some of it in the CIPs, and again, I'm, I'm looking for action of the CIPs, but it doesn't mean that the, the CIPs aren't going to change and, you know, be malleable as we go along. Okay, any other comments, questions? Yes. Uh, a question from 30,000 feet. <laughs> I keep hearing sort of a not clear duality here. Is the goal to narrow the achievement gap or is the goal to get all students to improve? Because those are can be very different things, as I said at a meeting or so ago. I think both. We're really trying to make sure that, you know, the, the I'm going to use the 20% that aren't meeting or exceeding the standard. <coughs> They're able to get what they need, in addition to those that are meeting or exceeding, are able to continue to go even beyond that, right? Um, and to have more opportunities to apply their learning um, so it's really it's really for both uh, currently the big the, the current the big concern for us is that is that gap of kids that aren't getting that right and that that number continues to be a, a concern for us and certainly for Vermont it continues to be um, a gap that continues to widen and so we're concerned about that and again I mean, a lot of people will say, well, you're, you're a good district, you're doing really well, but you also need to look at the subgroup and say, mm, we, have some, we have some work to do. In addition, all of, again, some of our students that are not identified are some of those students that are not meeting those standards. And so it's, it's, it's both. It's both. But I think it is useful to distinguish the two questions, and I wonder if specialization isn't the right way for kids who aren't in these at-risk populations of free and reduced lunch or on an IEP or a 504. Uh, my takeaway from the DMG document was that the exemplar district had a special education teacher coaching the general classroom teachers to get them up to speed with dealing with those populations. Mm -hmm. And our switch from nine paraeducators to five special educators could provide a way to do that, right. but that isn't specialization. That's right. Well, some, some, might, some actually people actually would quantify that way. Again, it's a lot in the definition and the interpretation of what it, what it is, it's the model that's being expressed. Some people may call that something totally different, partnered, partnered teaching, paired teaching, you know, co-teaching, specialization, you know, there's a lot of different, and I think that's part of the takeaway is that we need to be more clear around what, what it is we're, we're wanting to do, and I don't know that we need to label it necessarily, we need to be clear about what it is and what it isn't. Yes. I um, want to thank Bridget for pointing out the part where it says about um, where parents were concerned about the process and the timing. We have a lot of parents um, that are concerned about the changes. And sitting here hearing the, the, the different definitions between co-teaching and specialization, mm -hmm. special ed and such, you have a very talented staff in South Carolina. I've had the pleasure from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade of experiencing how they've transformed my kids. They know my kids. There are tons of research out there with this population, the young population, that the teacher-student relationship is huge. The first definition that I heard of specialization sounded a lot like departmentalization, and I know you distanced, but unfortunately I've done a lot of research. Those two terms are used interchangeably when you're dealing with elementary students in terms of case studies and research that's been out there. I have not found any proof of academic gains in terms of case studies and research that I've done. Um, when I initially came to the first school board meeting, I tried to have an open mind, despite the fact that my knee-jerk reaction was negative. This is my life. I've been doing this for 20 years, nine and 10 years. I have three little ones at home. I wanted to have an open mind. I contacted colleagues, I contacted former principals, and I really dotted my I's and crossed my T's. I didn't find, I found no research on academic gains in terms of specialization. Leaving, some on co-teaching, I think it, I just want to reiterate, you really need to be transparent with the parents because I know the school board and we want what's best for our kids, and I'm afraid that we're going to lose that relationship that has made them thrive. So I just want to put that out there. Oops. 
Thanks for your letter, too. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right. Thanks. We'll move on to agenda item eight, and that is master planning mm -hmm. and visioning. Yeah. Next steps. So, again, we are um, highlighting some additional information that we provided, although it's not new, but it, we, we did get you the kind of the, mm -hmm. our phase two data. Again, thank Bill Whittier for a pretty quick turnaround from comments and then getting, getting this out to us, and thank Gary for getting the binders out to you as well. Um, so at this point, um, I think it's really an opportunity for the board to dialogue and ask questions. I'm sad that I, you know, I can't have all the administrators here. As you heard, we've got academic nights going on and on this Thursday. Um, so I don't have uh, high school folks around. Patrick wanted to be here to answer questions. Um, and we'll do our very best to answer questions. But our hope is, is that in a pretty, pretty uh, deliberate process, um, We've been really, really um, fortunate to be able to have Bridget. I don't know that Bridget would say the same, but she's devoted a ton of time for us, and we really, we really do appreciate it. She's traveled with us to, to Massachusetts, and she's been uh, excellent with um, you know our working group, and has provided a whole lot of help, and that's really been appreciated. Um, so I, we're, we're really happy to answer questions. Lee Dor obviously is here too to answer questions if there if those that come up. But it would be my hope that we'd be able to give some additional direction on where we want to go because right now we have eight options on the table and we can't do any additional refinement until such time an option or option uh, options I suppose or option is picked where we then can go forward um, with whatever decision the, the board makes I suppose a no option is is one too and that's we get clear marching orders there although you know we still have um, areas that we need to pay attention to in this particular these two schools. So I don't know, um, I know NEASC information was there and at, at your places information, again, we know that some of you have seen that before, but we're trying to make sure that you have all the information available. And then some of, also Gary included uh, on the very back page of that, some of the bonding information, as some of you also have had questions about that. And Gary would be the first to tell you that, you know, um, there's some pretty significant variables that apply to that, that you have to be a little bit careful about. So we want to put that caveat in there as well. I don't know, Gary, anything else you wanted to add before the board gets going and conversation? No, I think, you know, between the, the explanation that I gave you Monday and Bridget added some notes that are in the email that's attached mm -hmm. to the front of that, you, you, the understanding of the of the financing is, is really, that, that picture is not going to be clear to you in, until you get a, get a, dir a direction, um, we get a, like a phase construction plan so we can develop a bonding schedule so we know how much we have to draw so we know what, you know, what interest rates and what we can recapture through the process of rapid amortization where we are paying back um, our bond on an annual, well, a semi-annual basis, actually two payments a year, um, and that money then becomes available um, to the process again. So that is, uh, that is an elementary uh, big picture <laughs> overview of what bonding could look like. Um, but we unfortunately can't give you a great picture until um, we get a little more direction. And, and is it true, Gary, that there also could be other financing alternatives that don't translate into direct property tax impact? that don't translate into property tax impact? Direct property tax. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about kind of if, you, if you're going into bonding and working with, uh, um, like I think of um, Vermont Private Health. sales. Yeah, private mm -hmm. um, bond sales, for instance, where it's, um, I, I'm, I won't have any of the right terminology, but yep. brokered out of like Boston, and yeah, it's really no, people are electing the, in. Yeah, but the They'll still have still. The service of those when we pay them back taxes. would still have to come through our you, budget. You got to pay for the service, right. but I think what Elizabeth is alluding to, I believe, is that you have a private bond sale, and then people are, you know, then those are sold out outside of the South Burlington taxpayer. I think. Well, and I'm and likening then, them those to like there's many hospital bonds that come on for the um, uh, in Vermont that would come onto the bond market. And 
thinking about people who might be looking at a portfolio that they want to shift some mm -hmm. of their investment to bond where it's a, a more predictable but, but um, you know, Sounds low return, yeah. for instance. Um, but is, are, are those financing alternatives available to projects like this? Yes. They are. Um, in my conversations with Bob Fletcher, it's 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 likely because of the 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 small total pool of Vermont Municipal Bond Bank mm -hmm. funding that's available. We'll likely have to have multiple sources yeah. of um, of financing to to get to the to the end of the project. Again, depending on what option you pick, right? right? Yeah, changes that. I think I think Elizabeth, there are a range of. There, my understanding is there are a range of different ways of bonding, regardless of how that bonding works and how it's who it's sold to, mm -hmm. or you know how that money comes into the district. It still all has to be paid back, and the only way to pay that back is through our budget. And so all of that does. So Ultimately, it, 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 it but, might but change. Timing it or might change might, the okay. timing. It might change yeah. the rates. You know, it might change. You know what that looks like, but it all still has to be paid back through our budget. So um, that's. It's just that this note that I had sort of mm -hmm. had Gary pass along when he passed on his his rough calculations, um, just sort of you know <clears throat> clarifies that. There is not a way, really, if we do any of the, the major work. If we do infrastructure only, potentially, mm -hmm. um, there could be a way to do it through the bond bank. But they can't have one particular borrower be more than a certain percentage, percentage of their the total, portfolio. Yeah, yeah. Um, and given how much they bond in a given year, any of these other bigger projects would be above that limit. Mm -hmm. um, all these assumptions that are in here are about you know the financing being done at current rates through mm -hmm. the bond bank, as mm -hmm. if it were done through all through the bond bank. Um, it's also done, my understanding, Gary, is this is done as one lump sum. Like we were borrowing it, all, we were drawing it all down all at once, and it wouldn't be done that way. Mm -hmm. um, it also then takes into account all of the 2020 school year, mm -hmm. fiscal year funding assumptions. So yield, CLA, equalized pupil numbers, all of those kinds of things, which are automatically going to change every single year. So we're going to have to adjust as we get deeper into the project mm -hmm. to try to get an estimate of what that's going to look like. Um, and again, the cost estimates, Lee is the first one to tell you that these sketches are very, very high level mm -hmm. and we really have not dug into them. They look beautiful on paper because they do good work, but they are very, very high level cost estimates. <coughs> so even the amount that we're going to have to go out and ask for is going to be um, it'll necessarily be different than, than what we've seen so far. So there are a lot of different <clears throat> variables. We did want to get some potential cost information in front of folks um, as we think about moving on to the next phase. So, so Bridget, can I ask you to clarify, because I think it's it was helpful to me mm -hmm. to understand the guardrails around what would be helpful for the direction the board to give tonight. Yes. If possible. So we've talked about um, in a couple of other meetings that really if we are going to target, really we have two potential dates in mind for when we would move this project to a vote for bonding. Um, ideally, in my mind, it would be town meeting day um, this coming March. In order to do that, really tonight <laughs> or very soon thereafter, we need to give Doran Whittier some direction uh, um, to go and actually do a deeper design, a more detailed design that actually has m more realistic cost estimates that can be used to get to a bond vote. If we don't make uh, that decision in the you know tonight or you know very soon thereafter, um, it will be very hard to make that March date. If we miss that March date. Um, it really pushes the project out a year, even if we were to go in November of 2020, um, which obviously would be a great turnout because it's a presidential election, um, just because of the timing of the year and construction schedules and all those kinds of things, we'd really push the project out a year as opposed to just you know six months or seven months. Um, and so what they really need from us, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, I did have a chat with Rob today about what they need from us, is ideally we would say, the outline of one of these options kind of fits what we're thinking as a board. So go off and start to do work on that. Um, they also need from us, um, ideally, if there are any sacred cows on the site as we go to do design work. So for example, if, if that track really does need to stay where it is, 
or if those trees between the middle school and Dorset Street need to stay where they are, they need to understand if there are any hard barriers or parameters as they really start to dig into design work. Um, and you know, it's possible to say, hey, show us what the cost would be if we chose to put it in a different place on the site or not. So we don't have to tie ourselves to, yes, tear up the track tonight, but we also, um, we just need to keep in mind whether we're gonna, if, we, if, if that is a hard stop for us, we need to let them know that before they start designing. Um, and beyond that, I mean, my understanding is that we need to give you an option. If we can't come to an exact option, um, Rob said we really need to narrow it down to two. Um, that can kind of be brought a little bit further forward in the process in terms of comparison of those two and which one is going to be closer to meeting our needs. But, um, but they really need to hear from us a, a clear direction on, you know, are we, um, are we just addressing infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Are we just addressing infrastructure plus some educational needs? Or are we really focused on addressing as many of the educational needs as we've identified um, as possible? along with obviously the infrastructure. So I think easiest for me would be for us to, you know, get to the end of the meeting and say, we think option eight, say, fits our needs the best, Dorm Whittier, get started working mm -hmm. on that. Um, later in the process, we will have to have other action and motions about, you know, hiring the right project manager. You know, we've had a little bit of offline discussion about that, and Dora Whittier can help us think about whether that's someone who sits at the district. You know, who, where that person comes from, what the right qualifications are, all that kind of thing. Um, and we would also have to have motions about, you know, hiring counsel to help us with bonding and financing and all those kinds of things. Those decisions we don't have to act on tonight for Lee and his team to really get started doing the work. What they really need is just a clear direction of what we want what we want to come out of this process. I and my like. understanding, too, is this does not prohibit, uh, in fact, it specifically allows us to move forward on engaging the community in a deeper dialogue. Yes, right. And that is specifically, I mean, I drafted a little bit of the outline of a potential motion that, that I could make and somebody could second later on. And, and um, yeah, one of the elements in it is the design process should include significant input from mm -hmm. faculty, staff, administration, parents, students, and the broader community. So <coughs> there are those kinds of high level elements is what they need to hear tonight, not the, not the, the super detail about you know, which building we want to go first or seconds mm -hmm. and, you know, those kinds of things. We need to just sort of give them enough direction to really dig in a little deeper. I think so. that's good. I also think it's, you know, this is an open meeting and board members, you know, need to be able to sound off with mm -hmm. where you're thinking, whether that's in, you know, on par with what you're thinking or, or totally different, you know. I mean, if I can just start broadly, I mean, what do I want? I want two new schools. That would be great. And then mm. we, we took these tours the last couple of weeks, and uh -huh. then it becomes a question of what do you need? And I felt like after I had the high school tour, the school kind of makes its case for itself. Pat Burke did a good job of seconding that case. It looks like we need a new high school. It's overcrowded. There were kids working in hallways. There are leaky ceilings, you know, all kinds of opportunities being missed in terms of education. I didn't get that same strong impression from my tour of the middle school. And, and given that we three did it together, you know, you can tell me that I have it all backwards. But the case here seems to be there's some outdated physical plant that's going to fail at some point. Boy, I wish there was more daylight. But from the few teachers that we talked to along the way, I did not get the impression that lots of opportunities are being missed. It's just kind of ugly and old, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So if it's a question of need, the high school, I think, is a need, and the middle school is sort of a want, which makes me wish that I could vote for option five because it was going to be a lot cheaper and then you see that it's actually not that much cheaper. So I, for me, I feel almost forced into options five and eight, and I, just, I sure wish five were cheaper. <laughs> That's where I'm at. So, so I, I, I went into this or not really understanding what the need might, might be because I look, at, I look at how well we are doing in educating our kids uh, my daughter's a junior now, and I don't use that as the only data point, uh, but, she, but she's done great. Um, so it's, it's often tough for us to make changes in South Burlington School District because we have pretty darn good outcomes. Uh, so, I mean, I start at that point, and I think, well, you know, do we, you know, how much better are we going to get if we build two new schools? You know, this is kind of my, my starting point. 
Um, but but I think you know, I've, I, I've changed my view a little bit for a couple reasons. Uh, one is how much money it would cost to bring these schools up to snuff for the next 50 years. Do I want to spend $50 million for just nothing that we will see to, to improve the situation? Um, in addition, you know, we are looking forward, and we do, and we do see uh, certainly areas that we could have a lot better offerings. Uh, you know, we're not perfect. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of kids who are not finding their way through our schools. So uh, I think that we can uh, show that uh, the schools and what we've learned and what I've learned through you since I was unable to go to some of these, uh, I was unable to go to any of the, the uh, tours, uh, that the environment, the learning environment, is so much more positive uh, at these other schools. So, so I do. I, where I am coming down is is very similar uh, to where Brian is. Although I will throw out another uh, question on that, and that is, I really feel that that we should be proceeding with a new high school. Uh, I'm I'm not convinced for a couple of reasons that now is the time to proceed with a uh, new middle school or necessarily even a renovated school, middle school that brings in sunlight and, and, and so I, I'm not sure that any of the eight uh, really fit exactly where I am right now, which would be uh, bringing this building up to code, up to snuff. There's got to be a better phrase than up to snuff. What's what's the technical <laughs> phrase? Standard. Up, up to standard. standard up to make it. Extend the life of the building. Thank you. <laughs> extend the life of this building, and and building a new high school. I mean that's. I don't see how much, the renovation of this building right now, and and it, and I'm looking at this more of, of a phased, approach as well because I'm also had a little bit of sticker shock even though I understand that there are estimates that I don't think that we can get this community to be behind that level of a bond for both a middle school and a high school <clears throat> I, I mean I think we might be able to get there after we build a high school and and then the next phase is to go to the you know to the community you know, for a middle school you know that's a possibility but putting that all up front right now, I th really think it'll be difficult. From and, and, and I've been talking to various individuals, and you know, and, and and I'm getting a lot of uh, uh, startled looks at at, uh, at at the cost that we've been talking about. Uh, so that's kind of where I am. Uh, I, I mean, I'm certainly open to being convinced uh, that no, we should go ahead and take a shot and try to get the community behind building two new schools um, I just don't like the idea of putting a bunch of money into this building just to renovate it right now when maybe in five to ten years after we have a new high school that maybe at that time uh, trying to also build a new middle school you know I think I think Martin I was where you were at on that having been on the tours and and you know um, gone through that and, and I think Brian, your description is is accurate of sort of the the need was more clearly made at the high school. And I also think what struck me was um, sort of the safety security elements of the the building design. And they're not as prevalent at the middle school, nor is the developmental stage of kids kind of, you know, adding to that need for passive supervision, as it were. But um, you know what I what I'm concerned about is is the you know it's sticker shock one way or the other and I I'm concerned about we're dealing with two 50 year old buildings and I don't think it would be five years I think the appetite of the community to really look at something significant might be another 10 20 years mm -hmm. and then you have have a 70 year old building and and I worry about that I mean, I'm worried about the tipping point right now for investments and in retrofitting and getting buildings up to standard. At what point are you investing, you know, 
money to keep things up to standard that um, tipped you over the point when you, you could have done a make versus buy decision X number of years ago. The other component to me that hit home is I, I really think the notion of shared services between buildings it is a good concept. I think, um, you know, the number of conversations we can have about renovating, you know, five cafeterias or more than five cafeterias or um, the infrastructure associated with boilers and air conditioners and things like that. I mean, those, those are big ticket items that um, as long as we have five facilities, we're going to have have those big expenses that come up on a more routine basis and I I look at the the idea that I think we can provide better and more efficient learning opportunities for kids by consolidating some of those shared services um, over you know in a, in a consolidated space um, and the other thing that that struck me about this and you know Brian you made a great comment when we got off the tour that um, we we often hear from parents, and this was my own experience, is element, our elementary schools are really welcoming environments in the community where parents are engaged, they're in the classrooms a lot, volunteers are, are sought out, um, there's a great um, interaction with staff and teachers, and then you drop your kids in middle school and you see them three years later, mm -hmm. and um, it it is both developmentally challenging and and this building, I think, um, creates a, um, it, it's, it's not a great environment for kids to be going through that. And either from, I don't want to say it's just welcoming, and that's not a reason to bond for a significant yeah. amount of money. But I also think the, we, we're hearing a lot about, you know, kids in trauma and mental health and things like that. And I do think our buildings are kind of are dated and they're old and this is a very institutional building um, and I think about the incremental opportunity if we do if we work hard with the community to kind of create an environment that kids can look at that continuum of 6 through 12 and uh, really have a, a great shared experience um, and, and I think that contributes to a lot of our ends as well from a, from a um, personal development standpoint and from a citizenship standpoint in particular. Um, but I also think there's the potential for some efficiencies around that supervision, around the teamwork we're talking about. Um, so I, I think my thinking changed from a, you know, kind of a, a practical appetite standpoint for sheer dollars to something that that might be a little more, in, well, is more ambitious for sure, but also might serve the community a lot longer and serve our, our kids and staff as well. That's kind of where my, my head's at. I guess, I mean, I, I, just a, a comment on that uh, real quick. Uh, I mean, I, I can see where, what you mean on that, except that uh, just in the tour, but not even just the tour that we took, but, but my, uh, I, I, tutored over here for a while when, when uh, my kids were in the school. And I, I mean, uh, the atmosphere and what was going on seemed to be more of what age the kids were than what building they were in. I, I don't know how much the, the building would change any of those issues that, that you mentioned. Is. For me, it was Shelburne, that, the, the tour of Shelburne, that kind of brought it home for me. And and the way Shelburne is designed, and it was a door and Whittier building, too, or, or a wing, um, the fact that we have teams that are kind of split up, you know, so there's a classroom over here for this <coughs> team, there, you know, science classroom might be here, you know, their other classroom for, you know, um, ELA might be, or English language might be, uh, or language arts might be on a different floor or on a different part of the building. I, the feel of being in your own little pod with your team, with all of your teachers there, and for the teachers, the teachers came out to talk to us in Shelburne about how they had been previously lined up along a hallway, which is better in some ways than what we've got now, which is people sort of scattered um, about the building. And still, when they were lined up on the hallway, 
they made a point to go and have meetings and sit down and talk <coughs> to each other. But being in this little pod with this welcoming space where the kids come in and the team of kids comes in in the morning and interacts with each other in this welcoming space, and then their classrooms are arranged around the outside of it, those teachers opportunities for informal collaboration and checking in with, hey, so-and-so is not doing so great today. Do you have any insight into what might be happening with this child? That kind of informal collaboration increased dramatically and it increased the teacher's satisfaction with what they were doing. It also improved the kids' attitudes toward their learning and toward their school and made it, I mean, some of the kids talked to us about how it made it a place that they wanted to come as opposed to a place they felt forced to come. And that's where that that one as well as, as I would say Shelburne even more than Gates Middle School, which is in Situate and is a beautiful building and has a lot of the design elements that I would hope to see if we chose to, <coughs> to do a major renovation or a new building. Um, even more so, that concept and really sort of seeing it in action on a school day and seeing how the kids and teachers interacted with each other really brought home for me just how much a building can improve that sense of community and that sense of it being a place that kids want to go even during a challenging developmental time. Um, and I had another point and I lost it. <laughs> but that, that for me was, was a big sort of aha moment that sort of some things that we sort of think of as extra sometimes can really make a big impact on how the kids think about their learning. Ah, and the, the point was for me that I'm just, I'm just concerned that when you lose a kid, when you lose their engagement, when you lose their excitement about going to school at the middle school level, it's pretty late in the game. And, and that happens, I think, at middle school often. And it's hard to get that back in high school. And that's why I just, I, I would really like to make a case for either doing a major renovation or building a new middle school at the same time for a number of reasons. Happy to jump in now, but I also want to make sure Alex gets some airtime because you guys have had a lot of airtime <coughs> for me. I'm happy to kind of wrap up once he's done, or if you would like me to keep going, I'm happy to. That's fine. You want to? You want to? No, go keep right ahead. Going? No, go okay. right ahead. Go right okay, ahead. sure. Yeah, thank thank you for the opportunity to take these tours, um, and I I think my impression was pretty similar to what you said, Brian. It seems as though the needs for the high school are a little bit greater than what the middle school needs, and one thing in particular is that there's been a lot of discussion about. Uh, natural light for the classrooms and in here in the middle school we're we're making do without it um, I, I'm not sure how important that is <clears throat> or, or not so I'm not sure how much design needs to be put into that or, or not but I, I think I would be more comfortable asking the voters to fund for a, a new high school and doing very little to this middle school at, at this time. Perhaps this is something uh, we, we could do another 20 years, and I hate to say that, I, you know, maybe we can get this building to go for another 20 years. Um, the high school itself was built in pieces, and every time a new piece was made, accommodations had to be made, you know, it's like changing the front door and so on, and changing how you get around the building. And now it, at this point, it just doesn't work very well at all. And, <clears throat> you know, the kids and the teachers have been pretty resilient in making do with what they have, but it does seem like there's a lot more room for improvement if we were to go with a new high school than uh, if, if we were to go to, with a new middle school. Um, <clears throat> and I also struggle with the, the, the cost of it. I think this would, um, I, I just plugged into a spreadsheet, uh, 150 million as a, relatively round number and, and if you amortize that at for 20 years at three percent it's at 10 million a year and that's 20 percent of the current school budget so that would be a very big ask for something like that so um, something like option eight I think would be it, it would be hard to it, it would hard for me to stand behind and I think a lot of voters would have a hard time voting yes for it I, I think we'd uh, we, you know, we could go go ahead with this vote after planning for years, and, and it ultimately gets rejected. Um, so, so I think that's where where we would be going with that. Um, um, as far as some of the other, you know, I've got a lot of detailed things that that I wanted to address. Um, you know, that when this when this school and, and SBHS were built, they were pro I don't know what the expected lifespans of them were, but. It, it seemed as though they were expected to last for maybe 40, 50 years or so. And I, I don't know if 
back in the 1960s, people expected South Burlington to be growing as much as, much as it did in the 50 years between then and now. But I, I think at this point, we ought to look at, you know, where, you know, maybe take some of that growth and then extrapolate that another 50 years or even think, you know, would it be possible to build a school building that would be around for 100 years or 75 years instead of a 50-year school building? And, and in that case, we'd probably have to go bigger or at least have something that would be able to have an add-on put on 20, 40 years from now and have it be a one that is consistent with the structure and the, the flow of the building or, or how people flow through it, as opposed to what's been done at South Burlington High School where we, you know, we started with two wings and an auditorium in the middle and a, and a gym, and then now we've got the art wing, now we've got the library and the science on the second floor, and, you know, the front door has been completely moved, and uh, there, there's a lot of workarounds that are, are a problem for the high school. So, um, <clears throat> kind of with that in mind, I was hoping we could go back and ask ourselves, you know, how long would some of these new options conceivably last when we get to the point where we need a high school that can house 1,200, 1,300, 14, or 1,500 kids instead of the, uh, what, 1,000 or so Roughly. that we have now? We have 925 right now. 925. And so I guess I was hoping we could take a an even longer term look at where we're going to be. Um, I, know, I know SBHS, I think it was built for, what, 750? Mm -hmm. um, Changed a little bit, but again, our, our enrollment at our high school is, in the, as Bridget said, but remember we have a good number of students that go from here over to there and plus yeah. up by 50, 60, you know, throughout the day. So yeah. Yeah. You know, load, load on the school is you know, right at its upper limit. Yeah, and, and it's at, a, at, its, at its upper limit, and we're also talking about, you know, hearing from the demographers that right now we're in a, an expected, what people have started to call the baby bust, as opposed to the baby boom that happened after World War II. What happens if, you know, in, in 10, I don't know, 15 years from now, the opposite of a baby bust happens, and lots more kids are coming up through our schools, and South Burlington school population increases by a lot. So I, I was hoping that we could have, maybe you could call it a contingency, but uh, plan for the what-if scenario if um, we it's, get a lot more kids. It's and, one of the options in the evaluation criteria. Yeah. So earlier in the process, um, the working group shared this very detailed evaluation criteria that Dora Moodyer helped us create. and. Um, one of the one of the line items in that evaluation yeah. criteria was how expandable, how flexible right. would this design <clears throat> be if we needed to add on to it? Um, and I think because these are such early stage drawings, all of them are reasonably flexible. There are some mm -hmm. tricky places on the site that if you do wedge the school into certain places on the site, it yeah. can be challenging then to add on to it. So that's something that's a detail of the design process that we'll have to figure out. I'm not sure that that... Um, that helps us determine tonight which option we would need yeah. to we would need to ask them to go forward. Yeah. Um, and just to put some specificity around the capacity numbers. So right now we have I actually have 921 is what the demographer had Whatever. in his yeah. report for this year, and the theoretical capacity of this or the high school is 880. So we're 105 percent of capacity mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Demographer is projecting that um, we will grow by about 124 students over the next 10 years so that we would be at 1,045 students which would put us at about 19 percent over capacity uh, by 2029. Um, and I have some concerns you know the demographic projections really only take into account things that are really permitted and ready to be built. So that does not take into account any of the further expansion of housing in South Burlington. Um, it also doesn't take into <coughs> account any of the statewide trends um, with regard to capacity of other high schools potentially closing because of mergers or because of demographic changes in other parts mm -hmm. that could end up having people move here or tuition students here. I don't want to make too much of that, but it is a consideration that we could end up with more tuition students or more people moving to South Burlington because they know we have a high school. So the capacity issue is a really, is a really big consideration mm -hmm. for sure. Um, the middle school we do have a little bit more space. Its theoretical capacity is 750 students. 
um, we have um, 575 students right now. So we're at about 77% capacity. In 10 years, we're expected to grow to about 632 students, which would put us at 84% capacity. Um, the challenge that I find with capacity in this building is that we're not utilizing it particularly mm -hmm. well. So there are big chunks of the building that are sort of underutilized during a big chunk of the day and other parts that are overutilized and feel cramped and, and overutilized. The other consideration is that um, there have been different discussions, and if we want to have the flexibility to move the fifth graders here, not that that's a current discussion at the moment, but mm -hmm. if that were to potentially become a necessity because of other issues at the elementary schools or something that we wanted to do because we decided down the road that it provided more opportunity for students at the fifth grade level, that would, in 10 years, the fifth grade will have approximately 190 students. So if we added those 190 students to our 632 that we're expected to have in six through eight, that would put us at 822 students or 110% of what the building's theoretical capacity is if we just did infrastructure and didn't do any add-ons or any changes in, in how the building is really configured. So that's just a little bit more on capacity because yep. you, you had some sort of, yeah. Thank you, and I, and I did have something, uh, just, a, just a little bit more of a detail. Um, you know, we, right now we're talking about um, the new, <coughs> you know, what would, our, what would our new schools look like? And if, if we're gonna build a new school that's gonna last for more than 50 years, um, I, I think it's gonna have to be able to adopt to the character of the town around it as South Burlington grows. And I, what you're seeing now in South Burlington is we're starting to go, we're starting to grow vertically. So on Market Street, we've got four-story residential buildings. Farrell Street has, I don't know, 10 or 15-year-old residential buildings. They're condominiums, just slightly different. But, um, and also I think in terms of natural sunlight, you can't build a two-story building and have it be at, at this capacity and expect to have natural light if, if, that, if that's important. I'm not convinced that it is yet, but I think, you know, we, we should be starting to think about, you know, how, how high can we go um, and, I, and another considerate reason I'm mentioning that is because we're going to have to get both the construction of new buildings and the education of the current kids done on the same site, on the same, I don't know how many acres. And so we're going to have a 50 acres, you said? 82. A 82 acres on this block between Kennedy and Dorset. And, you know, it would be nice to have some, a, a, still have a, a, a field where the kids can go for recess or, or play a game so it, it would be incredibly crowded during the construction and I think uh, you know we're gonna have to go vertical um, I, you know that's that's what they do in larger cities and South Burlington's becoming a larger city and I think those are yeah I think those are again design considerations yeah. so what the architects did was designed <coughs> two-story buildings yeah. um, in the initial phase for costing because those potentially could be the most expensive. And mm -hmm. we also wanted to see if they would fit on the site because that mm -hmm. was a big consideration. Can we fit the square footage that we think is appropriate for mm -hmm. the educational um, product that we want to deliver mm -hmm. on the site in, in these different configurations? All of those issues about whether we add a third story or you know, even oh, yeah. a fourth story and how we get natural light into spaces like that. Um, we saw plenty of new schools that have natural light even with multiple mm -hmm. stories because they're built in Massachusetts on these tight little sites mm -hmm. that are in cities and they don't yeah. have the room that we do to expand um, horizontally. Um, and there are lots of clever architectural <laughs> tricks and designs mm -hmm. um, that can be used to make sure that that happens. But these are a lot of design um, focused things that we'll have the community weigh in on that all of us will get to weigh in on that the administration and faculty would weigh in on as we, we went through the process. And I don't think any one of these necessarily is better than another in terms yeah. of, of some of the, the natural light issues and, yeah. and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah can, I, can I say one thing? Sure. One last thing that I wanna say is that I've heard from some people about you know the various uh, projects one through eight that we've been looking at for the past month or so. Um, and the ones that involve modular temporary classrooms are not popular. <laughs> so, <For the feedback. laughs> uh, it, and it's also, you know, spending money on something that you ultimately don't have in the end. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I don't know if it's spending good money after bad, but it, 
it seems like it's a less efficient use of the money that we're spending. And, and that's where we get to the point where we're thinking, you know, well, if option one costs, or, or, or op if option A, I'm not going to call it option one because we haven't, I'm not, I'm thinking hypothetically, if option A costs, you know, X, X millions of dollars, and option B costs X plus 10 millions of dollars, well, it turns out, op you know, that option X is a pretty bare bones uh, construction and renovation, and option Y, which costs only $10 million more, which is maybe 15 or 10 percent, gets you a whole new building for the next 50 or hopefully even 100 years. So it seems as though the lower numbered options, um, which did involve the modular classroom, seemed less popular with the, with the public. And I think I'm finished yeah. sounding I think, off. Alex, Thank you. you know, one of the things you said that I think factored into to my evolving thinking on this was the um, disruption and um, you know and and the um, experience kids were going to have yeah. during that period of time. And honestly, I I kind of went to the side of we would be doing if we do it separately, we'd be doing the high school at one period of time, mm -hmm. and then sometime later, and even during that, if, if it were to last, mm -hmm. a 50-year-old building were to last another 20 years, if we can extend that lifetime, mm -hmm. we know we have to do the gym at some point. Mm -hmm. There's several areas we know we would have to do. Mm -hmm. So you could argue that that is sunk costs that we'll never recoup once we have to redo the building. But I also look at some of the efficiencies that were described in the concepts um, really allowed for um, smoother transitions or, or, or a faster timeline on the whole project yeah. by, mm -hmm. um, by doing them sort of side by side too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't have the specific details in front of me, but that was my recollection having walked through the two sessions with the public and kind of the timeline. And I have to say that did factor into my thinking mm -hmm. is it is more money but in the end, it's probably less disruption and, and a better experience for the students um, that would be impacted for a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know how you say that. But um, anyway, that, I, that was of consideration. Yeah. So a question. <clears throat> what, is, what, would, what is the component of the cost for just the infrastructure improvement, the getting this, this building ready for the next... 50 years it was 15 million just to do infrastructure you know, on, on, to, on this, this on 15, this building it, more of it of the 50 million that was just the pure cost it didn't have any of like the disruptions or if we had to that have, was the stewardship so if you were saying yeah. that we were planning specific stewardship items over right. a period of time 15, that 17. was about 15 million dollars that was the old estimate so that was the estimate <coughs> sort of from like phase one um but in order to do that, to we can't do it all in a summer. This building is simply too big and too complicated to do that in one shot. So there will be disruption to a certain extent with kids in temporary space. Um, unless we unless we did the high school first and kept the high school open as swing space and right. moved kids into the old high school and the high school kids, there are ways to do that. But there there's a potentially longer disruption to the middle school experience because it would probably have to be phased over about three years, I think, is the way it was broken up in, in one of the, the uh, options that sort of just did infrastructure. Um, so it would be it would be considerably more than $15 million once all the, the disruption factors and, and all the additional well, went, costs are factored. But, but, but if you did use the, if you phased it where the middle school could essentially move to the high school while this building is being done? It would be less than having modular trailers. My understanding, though, is that that, that, that $31 million was stuck in my mind, which was the sort of, the, if you took individual projects that all needed to be done at the middle school and the high school, I think it was $31 million that was from phase one, that came out of the phase one report, that did not have a lot of other costs wrapped into it that would actually, um, it, and it wasn't just the modular trailers, but <coughs> I, you might be able to list some of them. Three million more in project costs. Yeah. yeah. To make it happen, right? It to was, make it, it happen. It was a pure just to, to, do the, to, to, to do the work. But it didn't factor in, so that's why it went from the 31 to the 55. Right, but I guess I'm still trying to understand if if the so I hear at least what I've heard is all five board members think a new high school at a minimum is good mm -hmm. is is the direction. So if that were the case, 
And if we decided not to proceed with the middle school, I just would want to understand what that cost for that in that phasing, build new high school, move the kids over the middle school over to the high school, the old high school that is. You know, you said 23 million project cost, but that was not in that scenario. Correct. And, and I, so, but back to, I mean, I, I agree with all the things that you said. And if I, if money was no object and if I thought we could get this all through and it was not a problem, I, I, I think having a brand new middle school and high school built together would be awesome. Uh, you know, so, but I'm just still concerned about whether we can get the uh, community behind that. And, and part of it is to show, I, I think it's an easy, uh, it's not going to be an easy sell by any stretch. It's an easier sell on the high school than it is on the middle school. And if we lose the whole thing because we haven't been able to show a good enough story for the middle school, where does that leave us? So that's also my concern. I mean, I could go, mm -hmm. you know, I could put my full effort behind both new schools, but I'm just raising these as concerns. Um, so. In my mind, we're responsible for figuring out what we think is the right thing for the district and the kids and, and the educational um, delivery. And I think we need to figure that out. And it's our responsibility to share that vision and, and to get people on board with it. I do think that the design phase, especially as it draws on the community, will quickly tell us if that is a realistic possibility with regard to a new middle school or not. I think we'll get a very clear sense of, of where the community is on that after we've done some more sharing of, of well, at least uh, where I am mm -hmm. <laughs> on, the, on the potential for a, a new middle school. Um, because I, I'm with Elizabeth in that I think I don't think it's a, a five or a 10 year window between if we were to build a new high school and when we could get people to have an appetite. I think it's not just the financing. I think the disruption and the, mm -hmm. the no matter how well a construction project is managed and, and how well it goes, it's still a, a challenge for the people involved in it. I think the memory of the community of that is gonna have to have more than five or 10 years <laughs> to embark on another project, uh, both financially and disruption wise. And I I am in the camp that it would be 20 or 30 years, frankly. I think there would be a lot of people arguing that the whole bonding would need to be paid off and finished for the high school before we started a new middle school. And I am very concerned that, you know, we're already bumping up against the building when it comes to collaboration for students in their work passive supervision from the teachers to what the students are doing and collaboration amongst the teachers and how we're already bumping into this building. There are some things that really can't wait 20 or 30 years in this building to be addressed. One of them, and I know it sounds like it's not particularly educational, but the gym space has been an identified need for many, many years. So do we spend five or 10 or however many million that would be to, to do you know one end of the building to make sure that we address some of those needs? Or do we put that off and we ask the kids just to wait for another 20 or 30 years? Because I don't think it would be five or 10 years. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's worth making at least an attempt to talk to the community about why we think a new building for both of them is the right thing to do. I think there are benefits um, to the buildings being connected with enough division between them that you know we can obviously close them off. But shared services, as Elizabeth said, um, the ability for kids to flow back and forth between them um, to take full advantage of the product of the educational product that we are delivering. I think that um, kids aren't taking full advantage of that right now um, just because for scheduling reasons and things, there are things that are scheduled at the middle school that high schoolers don't want to take just because it's at the middle school. Mm -hmm. And I see the middle school kids pretty much every morning that I'm here for any kind of meeting, you know, trooping across in winter across the parking lot to the high school <clears throat> to try to take advantage of facilities that are at the high school. And having those two things together um, in, in an efficient way, I think, would, would be a benefit to all the kids from 6 to 12. Um, so that's, I am, yeah, I am clearly in camp option eight, which is to build new buildings. I think if a major renovation of this building were possible for much less money um, than option five would elude, I, I could be convinced of that position. But 
once you get so close to yeah. being a new building, it makes sense to me to do it appropriately and 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 have the flexibility to design, you know, the way we want. Um, especially because once you start to open up a building of this age, we already know because we have it in our stewardship plan every year that there are hazardous materials and there are challenges that you bump into that you're not even quite prepared for at the outset. And to be able to sort of do away with some of those challenges in one fell swoop and, you know, uh, just sort of get this project done all at the same time, I think has a huge advantage. The other disadvantage to waiting on the middle school is that project costs and construction costs go up about 5% a year. So if you're talking about delaying even a decade and with compounding and all that, you're talking about a 60% higher project cost for what you would want to do for a new middle school versus doing it now. And so that's a real, that's a real concern for me too, um, that if we do them now, um, or if we don't do both of them now, again, it, I think the challenge of trying to get a new middle school or a significant amount done at the middle school, um, I think that would be um, a really hard sell to the community for another decade or two. And I think that would be challenging. So is there a way, <clears throat> I mean, for me, it's either option eight or this new option that I have now put out there, mm -hmm. which is new high school and, and just infrastructure in the middle school. Um, so in proceeding, if we were looking at something like option eight, to kind of cover our flank uh, mm -hmm. as far as if we're unable to get the full community support. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, is, is the architect, are you able to plan this so that we don't throw all the planning away for the new high school if we don't get the support and we have to go back and, and scale back what we're trying to do? It wouldn't be atypical at all for you guys to make a decision based on the limited information that you have go through the process and for various reasons, whether it's cost prohibitive that you're hearing from the community and say we have to split these up, that's certainly something that we'd be planning for when we're putting all of this together. Even even though we're talking about a, a school, one big school, it is. There, middle and high school. There certainly be some changes because some of those inherent efficiencies when we talked about you know one physical plant serving a combined middle high school, you know one kitchen and two cafeterias, if we were planning down that road and then you guys came back to us and said, now we're gonna pull those apart, they're gonna have to be some changes made, but they're not substantial. They're, they're fairly limited in, in scope. So we're not gonna try and get you boxed into a, a corner. What we're trying to do is give you more information to be able to make you know more clear decisions with. Because right now we are running at about 30,000 square feet over, over the top of these. And what we want to do in this next design phase is really work the program and the square footage, which is your number one cost driver, and take away as many of the risk unmitigating factors as we can, you know, stormwater issues, mm -hmm. uh, um, and what's happening with the soils conditions, what's happening for a permitting thing. So we want to be able to check off all of those boxes to be able to say, this is what you can and can't do with this process, pro project and the process. And if you said, you know, we want to split up the high school separately, and from the middle school later, we could do that, but just know that there are gonna be some changes and some of those efficiencies that we're trying to build into a combined project that we'd have to separate later. And this happened in Shelburne, right? So yes. it was a bigger yeah. project, and mm -hmm. the original bond actually did get voted down, and then it got scaled back to do one wing of Shelburne Community School. Mm -hmm. um, so th this next phase yeah. is, is fairly limited, right? It, it's about 15% of total design phase. It's enough to get you that much more information. So you're not committing you know, everything through final design, and then you'd have to peel it all back, right? We're, mm. we're building on an iterative process. So it gets to another stage that you're gonna have much more detailed information. And if that's a decision you wanted to make at that point, you could still do it. Right. Tom, did you have a question or comment? I just wanted to add one thing in your contingency planning, uh, in your opening remarks, Bridget, mm -hmm. you did mention that there are actually three elections next year. So there's March and then there's an August state primary. So that's mm -hmm. gonna be how mm -hmm. the bond vote too. So I think this community is going to vote for and support anything you put forward and say this community needs. So I don't know. Yeah, the reason well, we had focused on March and November, no the reason we had focused on March and November was it's just traditional that the more we hear from voters, the more supportive they tend to be of initiatives. And those were the two elections that probably had the biggest turnout. And we would hear the clearest, the, the biggest cross section of the community and what they really thought about it. But yes, thank you for that. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Do you mind if I?
Oh, we would yeah, love to hear from you, Cole. So sorry. Oh. Yes, thank you. We've been waiting yes, for you to make you. this decision so, for us. Um, I just want to start off by saying I'm a second generation South Burlington student. My mom went here. She mm. went through the elementary schools as well. Um, and upon all of the parent teacher conferences she's been to, she's like, nothing has changed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I just want to bring that up. And um, I also, I haven't heard much in terms of like, what people, if people would want to have a separated high school, middle school. Um, my stepsister goes to U32, which is, a, which is the combined middle high, and I have not heard a single good thing about it. I hear a lot of the benefit, I understand the benefits of having this like mutual kitchen, mutual facilities, and that is really important. But I feel like, Students are at completely different de developmental stages, like from the middle school than the high school, and I know that we would have the, that division, but I don't. That's like a concern of mine, and I just wanted to put that out. Mm -hmm. um, I also have heard some things about um, having the teams be spread out. Um, I didn't see that as a problem. Um, I was on a team where. Our th where three of the core courses were on one story and our science class was upstairs. And it wasn't a problem for <clears throat> students. I, I can see how it can be a problem with teachers, like having that great, like being able to come together and see each other and talk collaboratively. But um, I guess that wasn't as big a concern f or a problem that we saw. Um, uh, let's see what else I wrote down. Um, I guess I'm really, first of all, I'm really thankful for the board members that went through the tours of the schools. I saw a few of you, um, I was in advisory and I'm like, hey, look, there they go. Um, <laughs> so it's really beneficial to like be in those buildings and see the buildings and see what state they're at. And I would agree with what everyone has said so far that the high school seems like more of a priority because like I called it, this is, <clears throat> I called it the school baby because there was like a trash can that was connected to the ceiling with like this tube and it kind of looked like an umbilical cord. And I'm like, what is this? And so like, it's really starting to show its age and like there's cracks and floor tiles coming up. And that, those things I feel should be addressed. And in the middle school, I didn't see as much of the building falling apart. It's not, the high school's not like falling apart. Like, well, it kind of is, but it's. <laughs> It has its problems, and yeah. I feel like they, I, I'm kind of losing where I was going with this, but um, I just want to emphasize the need for a new high school and how the middle school does also need some changes, but not as drastic as the high school does. If you were to make changes, Colt, to the middle school, what would they be? Um, that's a really good question. I feel like, that's a really good question. They, at the middle school, everything is kind of, like all education happens upstairs, in my opinion. Like mm -hmm. there are like three classes that happen downstairs. And um, seeing more of that spread throughout the building would be nice. There's just awkward rooms like, mm -hmm. there are two rooms off of the gym that get used maybe once. Like, we, I don't see them being used often. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's a space that could be used for something mm -hmm. else. Um, the chorus room is really undersized, and there's no window, and it's an ex there's an external wall right there. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but um, so, like, there's just, like, some awkward things about this building. They work, and we can deal with them. Mm -hmm. And they're not as bad as the awkward things at the high school. But, um, yeah, and on the terms of light, I, I didn't see it as a big a pro problem. Like, as a student, I was just like, oh, I'm in a classroom that I can't see at the outside. Like, it wasn't a problem for me. Um, and I know there's classes in the high school that are internal classrooms, and it's not a problem for us. Um, but, like, the science classrooms are the rooms that are the internal classrooms, which is kind of interesting because with science, it's a lot of things. It, nature is a big component of science. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> and not being able to see the outside is kind of a problem. So 
something to address that. And I know I'm I'm jumping around because I'm saying one thing, but it sounds like I'm trying to say the other. But <laughs> I, I guess what I've said so far, plus if you want me to add, try and answer more questions like that, I will do my best. But no, that was no, that was really. It's really helpful to hear your perspective, having having gone all the way through one mm -hmm. building and part of the way through the the next. Um, it's really helpful, and we probably should have asked earlier in the process. We have had some student involvement, so not to not to say that there hasn't been um, input. So there have been students at our visioning sessions and at the principals workshops and things. But um, but it's helpful to hear your perspective too, yeah. Cole. So thank you. Cole I stared out the window most of the time in my science class. That <laughs> 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 say, but that was that was. <laughs> that was me. That was me. Cole, may I ask you a question? Sure. I don't want to end up giving you more work, but if you get when you get the chance, would you mind asking um, what asking what is the problem with U32 and how they have their uh, middle and high schools together? You know, sure. it's, it it um, You probably you probably have some of that anecdotally, don't you? Oh. Yeah. Um sure. Go ahead. yeah. Go ahead. I know one of the things that she has said is that um, the when there's passing time and they the schools kind of have their small shared spaces like there I think there's like the atrium that is shared um, there's the passing time and the middle schoolers feel awkward around the high schoolers mm -hmm. and the high schoolers think it's kind of a joke that the middle schoolers are with them mm. um, and that that doesn't seem as big of a problem with how it is currently designed, it looks like, where there's the middle school entrance and the high school entrance, but where there is that crossover, um, I would want, and this would probably be more an administrative thing where they would make sure that there isn't those conflicts. Um, the other thing they, she worded this weirdly because I asked her this because I was ready to, I was like, I'm going to come prepared. But um, she said that the there was like some issue with cafeteria spacing and mm -hmm. that was, um, that it was another passing time issue. And yeah. I, I would want to come back with a more definitive what she has to say. Okay. But um, it was more of the, passing of the two um, groups. Okay, thank you. Other board comments or questions? Can we ask Lee, can you kind of respond to what you've heard? <clears throat> I know you did a little bit already, but it would be helpful to get your perspective on what you're hearing. You're asking all the right questions. <laughs> what, what I typically hear in boards that are trying to make these decisions and weighing out cost is obviously a big one. The, the benefits educationally to new construction or renovated spaces that you're designing the way you want them to be. The impact during construction is usually the single most talked about item with parents mm -hmm. um, to go through and, and the value of that. And you guys have all alluded to temporary classrooms, uh, just leaving the site at the end and it's just not a really good s expenditure of money and that's why you're seeing the renovation options come very close to the cost of new construction and it is typically that and unless there's a swing space that nobody knows about yet where you can have that you're going to incur that cost in any type of renovation project it's just inherent with it so and that's what we see typically in Massachusetts so that's why you see more and more new school construction happening in Massachusetts than you do renovated spaces because of those two issues. When you get to renovating, you know, whatever it is, a, a house, a school, any building, if you get to about 80, 85% of the cost of new, it's, it's a better bet to go new construction because you're gonna find that stuff once you start peeling it back and going through the renovation project. So the, the flexibility piece, Martin, that you brought up, I, I think is important. And I, I think some of that feedback that you're gonna get going through this next phase may crystallize that where it's it's an issue of cost we just don't have the ability to afford that right now and we have to do it in pieces you still have the ability to be flexible to do that if you went with an option that said you know let's develop two new schools plan for that and you get somewhere through that process and you say I just don't think we can afford it and we're gonna have to pull that apart you can do that 
if you came to us, you know, six months down the road and said, you know, that new construction thing, we think, you know, there's more value in this building, we want to look at renovating it, you know, it's going to take the timeline out a little bit further because we'd be heading in one direction and moving back, but the flexibility is still there. We're not, you're not going to get boxed into a corner in this phase that's going to say you have to go this way. You still are going to have some flexibility, but you're going to have a lot more knowledge than we do right now. And I think the biggest important piece of this next exercise is your program and the square footage mm -hmm. and the number of spaces because I see that right now is the, the biggest push on your pricing right now. I think, you know, the program that we've used for study purposes, I think is, can be cut back and still have all of the things that we've talked about, you know, once we spend some more time on it. The, the square footage, the number of classrooms, the size of the classroom. Okay, the, the educational spaces, program. The educational program. All right, program. thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and we've modeled that right now to come up with these options. But there's a lot more time that needs to be spent going through uh, staff and student interviews, you know, through this next design phase, community outreach to find out what we need to really find out what that square footage is, which has a direct correlation to cost. So I, I think, you know, if you went through with a new construction option, you're still going to have flexibility to make some changing of your minds down the road. Um, but you're setting yourself up. We're going to cover a pretty broad spectrum of taking out those risk factors, which is really the important piece. The square footage, you know, what's happening on the site, soils, permitting, you know, stormwater, all of those things. We're going to have a better cost, which you can then feed back into your financial model and say, is this something that we can do, something that we can't do? Um, I think you still have some flexibility. But those are the biggest pieces right there is disruption of the educational process during construction and then you know, how far you go in renovation when it really makes more sense to build in it. So do we need to have an action on this today to proceed? We have warned it for action, yes. Can, can I suggest what a motion would be? <laughs> Which would be to proceed with uh, option eight, but with this understanding this fallback is essentially uh, new high school and, and infrastructure at the middle school. I know that takes off the, at least right now, the concept of a new gym or those kind of things. New gym for, 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 for here, or expanded gym or some of the other needs here. I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of proceeding with, with option eight, given what I've heard about the flexibility as we get more into it, because yeah, that would be the optimal design and I agree with you Bridget that that would be the optimal design but I still that fallback position of really pressing the high school and keeping what we have now and sprucing it up long motion well I can make it shorter <laughs> any friendly amendments to the motion on the table do we have a second for that motion I can second that motion yeah any further discussion? Is there anything else we need to, would need to include in a motion for clarity sake? Um, the way I had started to draft this is I said, uh, and because uh, uh, Martin's already started, um, I had sort of said I move that the board instruct the superintendent. So I'm assuming that you need to instruct him, or do we instruct him so, directly? I'm so I will take a that. friendly amendment for what you've right. worked on, yeah. and, and kind of if you can incorporate what I've just suggested okay. into what you have okay. there. Okay. I would take that as a friendly <laughs> amendment. How about that? <laughs> okay. Um, so I move that the board instruct the superintendent to instruct our media, or is it us directly that are instructing him? I'm a little confused because this is that gray area of policy governance. It, it probably should be superintendent. Okay. So I move that the board instruct the superintendent to instruct Doran Whittier to begin the pre-bond vote design phase for uh, the middle and high school campus within the following parameters. The, di the design should, um, um, should focus on a new combined high school and middle school, so option eight, as it's been outlined in, in the work leading up to this, um, with the amendment that we should also consider um, a fallback position that would be a new high school with infrastructure uh, improvements only, the identified infrastructure improvements at the middle school. 
Um, the design number two, the design process should include significant input from faculty, staff, administration, parents, students, and the broader community. Um, the design process should produce a proposed plan and detailed cost estimates for a combined middle and high school um, and potentially um, a new high school with uh, infrastructure improvements only at the middle school. Um, and then the last piece was the one that I mentioned, but we didn't really get to. Um, I, I've got it written down, yeah, Delay. Yeah, so I will, I am happy We're to. We're I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give up after. <laughs> no, I'm happy. Um, the question is whether at this stage the design should take any elements as fixed on the site or not. Um, so let, let's yeah, they, they, go with the, the first three. Do we yeah. revise the, do you accept I the? With, I withdrew my motion and okay. she's just making so a motion. So I'm making <laughs> a motion. Do we have a second for? I'll okay. second. Okay. okay. Uh, and from a discussion standpoint, are there any sacred cows from the board's perspective that would be incorporated into that last bullet point? Is it, it's just we're talking about the track and the, the field, right? Isn't that? The track, well, the, the, the two main things in my mind were the track potentially because mm -hmm. we just put money into oh, it. Oh, and the trees. And the trees because that grove of trees is very old grove of trees. Um, and the question in my mind about the track was really um, we've put a million dollars into it given the size of the project that we're talking about. If a different design saved more than a million dollars, I can easily see a scenario where site design and after they do the soil testing and after they do you know all the work that they have to do, it might be that we keeping that track there costs us more than a million dollars added on to our project or it makes it less optimal in terms of where we would put things. So I would say in my mind, even though I, I love that track and we worked hard to you know to get it there, I, I would say in my mind that's not a sacred cow. The question for me is that grove of trees there. But, uh, but under this scenario, that grove of trees is not affected, right? Um, as the initial designs have been laid out, no. Um, but again, these are sort of very early stage designs. So the question is, are we giving them sort of free reign over the entire site, or are we blocking off this little grove of trees? Is this a, is this a requirement for this phase? It would be very helpful for us if, if you so guys you can, knew can't touch. Mm -hmm. that don't touch those trees, don't touch that track, which is what we kind of <coughs> brought on ourselves when we went through the study. If you guys were of that mindset, <coughs> that comes us in and saves us a lot of time. If you said no, you know, that it, it's open game out there. That just gives us some flexibility to come back with some stuff different from what you've seen now mm -hmm. for us to test to say, does this make more sense? I think, I think the, the governors from my perspective are would it further add to disruption for the student experience? You know, do you, do you have athletic groups that can't, mm -hmm. you know, work out on that field for a, a multiple seasons or I don't know what mm -hmm. the right scenario. Mm -hmm. So that one would be a governor. And then is there enough of a trade off in the total expense of the project as, mm -hmm. as Bridget described it? So kind of the, the put and take of the investment mm -hmm. that exists right now. Th those would be the governors for me. Mm -hmm. um, so not sacred cows, just those are they just, standards you'd look at. Yes. I agree with that. Cost benefit expense. Well, one thing that kind of, I know I bring it up every time, but like the bond vote that we, that put, was put out for the new um, facilities on the track, mm -hmm. um, you've said that we are moving forward with that. and. If we're not including that as something to be protected, I don't see why we would move forward with it if it's just going to get torn down again. And so, like, it it kind of seems like mo money that would be going to waste. And I that's just something that worries me, especially considering with you're trying to get the community to approve this. But hey, you know the money. Yes, yeah. 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 exactly. Absolutely. No, and that was that was the that was why in the initial design phase we also said. Don't touch the track. We just went through all of that with the community. It, it does stand to, the question is, the stuff that has not been built yet, <laughs> but has been approved. Um, yes. It's, it's most visible in those, and we are, we are planning right now to, to begin on that, as we are with other 
systems within the building, right? We're gonna we got to upgrade a phone system that's really old. So there's a lot of things like that that are mission critical that we have we've kind of triaged. Um, but you're not wrong. We're trying to be you know diligent about do we do this or don't we? And we've, again, put some things off in, in, our, in these two buildings because of the uncertainty or the possibility of a, of a change path. So, but, yeah. but out on the track, I mean, does anything have to go forward this summer? I mean, if we're going to have a vote next March, you understand well, better what we are going again, to do. Again, it's been in the queue, and, and it was passed by the voters, and it's been permitted, and so we're, and it's been an identified location for, you know, bathrooms, which are critically important to the outside functions of, of this property. And so it's in the queue. I mean, again, another example of adding to the overall cost, you know, mm -hmm. but it was passed by the voters. Right, but can it wait for a year? Not really. It's in... Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I, I suppose there's... The other wow. thing is it's not a year. I mean, if we got if this all went forward on the schedule and we got through March vote, it yeah, would be 2023, really, before the project was finished. I mean, granted, we would start it before then, but it would be 2023 right. before the new high school would be open. So there's some years If there. we miss that March date, then it ends up 2024 or potentially later before a new high school is open. So the question is whether we do without Those numbers bathrooms numbers. and changing rooms at the athletic facilities for another well but if the facilities aren't there <laughs> Three to four years. that's that's the question yeah can i chime in on that too um there there was um some discussion online about that and, and this th it would not be a precedent to cancel uh something that had been approved and i and i believe one example was the wood chip burning plant that was supposed to heat this building that never got never approved. got approved <laughs> yeah we never got approved they, no. but i think that there was another voter approved item that yeah, it was on the also was. did not get built well it did get that did get voter approval on the city get, side there was, there um, was I, I think too. he's talking about the the administrative building that mm -hmm. was out here and it it did get um voter approval but it didn't meet the 30 percent funding option by the agency of education back uh -huh. when education funding was available right okay so um well my personal preference would be we don't build it so how much money, how much is it going to cost the putting the bathroom in? Uh, just to, to add from the, the design mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. my goal looking at this, knowing that you've just invested, and it, it's in a pretty good spot, the track and field on the site, is unless there's a really compelling mm -hmm. reason from a design standpoint to take over that space with the building, I'm trying to stay away from it. And if you do, can you incorporate the the bathrooms that we're putting out there. <laughs> <laughs> we can reuse all the buildings. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay, we have a motion on the table and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. <laughs> wow. Now the, now the tough work now starts. Now the real work begins. <laughs> yeah. Gary, thank you. David, thank, thank you. you. Lee, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Okay, we dedicated a fair amount of time yeah, to that discussion, mm -hmm. so let's move on here. Uh, agenda item nine, uh, approval of CIP plans for individual schools and the district. So, again, we can do whatever you want. Um, I'd like to be able to approve these so that we can get them to AOE and, and be compliant. I do want to really clearly tell you that we've we've got some additional work to do when, you know, there's some added components. I would be open to receiving your feedback. I'm also conscious of time. Um, how, how much do these differ from what we saw not that long ago? I mean, which yeah, they pretty significant. Yeah, I, I'm, I, mean, I, I think didn't, they're pretty I didn't significant. Cross check them. But I think they're pretty significant additions okay. and we have some additions that are going to continue because we've got some some have named their committees some haven't got them on there I want those on there um, there's some additional pieces of clarity that we are going to work through and again our administrators um, have met the timeline with their committees to put this together but haven't had a cross-sharing which I think is critically important too um, 
and talking about you know where we are collectively. So we have we have some more additional work to do. Again, this is a requirement. Um, so, um, well, how how about this? Would it, if from a timing standpoint, could we offer some initial comments now sure. and then maybe put it on? A and a future agenda for action? Yeah, it would push on, it would have, it would likely push on to the 19th. The next one, okay. Yeah. It, was that okay with the rest of the board? Yeah, and, it, and you could, if you want, offer some now or do it offline and through email. You know, I'm, I'm conscious of people's time. We get a little bit more to go here, but. Um, well, why don't we have just brief comments now and then mm -hmm. um, we can continue. Um, I know one, I have a very fundamental question. Um, I'm looking at one that's titled South Burlington School District, and it says it's the <coughs> high school. And then I'm looking at another one that's South Burlington School District, but it lists all the schools. Yeah, so one's In this district, one overall. Yeah, there's one for each of the five schools, and then there's the sixth that covers everything. Yep. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Okay, I, I couldn't. No problem. And and you, uh, so you you're looking to add the teams on each of these. Well, not. I mean, like if you look at the district, we have our CIP team that's identified. Mm -hmm. But if you go to, I think Rick like Mark Orchard named its team. Named it, but Rick Marker but did not. not. And you know that's so. There's some completeness here that's needed. That would be we helpful. Bring. And then you yep. also haven't had a chance to look across the schools for consistency between them? Well, some of the district staff have, but what I'm also saying to you is, that, and this will happen no matter what, mm -hmm. that I want, if you're Rick Marcott, I want Orchard and Chamberlain to hear, as well as the high school and middle school. So there's some continuity around what we're doing um, and important for our folks to hear from the high school and the middle school about what what are some of the expectations? What are our struggles? What are we working on? So, okay. And that's probably the only observation mm -hmm. I would make at this stage, which is I was looking for some of that consistency without, mm -hmm. but also what was unique to the facility versus what was just sort of, um, you know, like everybody's got the global end statement in, but mm -hmm. what is unique to the, to the facility. Other, other comments or feedback? I had a quick question. Which, and this is a, maybe a very detailed question, but um, was, what does an intervention block look yeah. like at the elementary school? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So right now the, the, the block, what we're calling, um, might be a little bit different in some places in the state, but an intervention block is an actual time period where, you know, supports can be rendered for, <clears throat> again, I would say a shorter period than art, music, and physical education and library, but it's an intervention block where some very focused um, support can be given to students, and students can have some choice to be able to get what we know is most needed. So we call those, again, this is part of some of the new research that's out there, it's an intervention block. So it allows for students to be able to go and get the support that they need from highly, highly qualified folks. So I'm confused, does that mean, for example, like a whole fourth grade classroom would split up into different, they would go different directions, so, the, so someone might yep. go to, a literacy coach, someone might That's go right. to a math coach, yep. someone might go to a special educator or a speech therapist or, you know, whatever it is. And so there's a period of time carved out during the day is what you're saying. We're, and then what happens if a well, child everyone, doesn't have a... Well, everyone would be assigned. So again, assigned it's, it's, okay. it's an important component of... Okay. It's not a free-for-all, it's a planned. And the schedule has to also be worked on, you know, it has to be able to accommodate that. So you have an intervention block that's actually pl planned part of the day that obviously isn't all the whole school all at the same time. It's grade level grouping that ha makes that happen. And so it's a nice opportunity to, again, really focus in on some support that might be needed. Um, again, but it is assigned. It's not a, f a free for all. There's often a worry when you say, you know, it's just an open block. It's not, it's an assigned piece. Mm -hmm. I think I had a question about one of the Tuttle goals, um, how to address the needs of students who are experiencing difficulties in the general education setting without additional support. Um, how might one do that? <laughs> you have a page on that. Uh, so that is on Tuttle, and it was one, two, three, four, five, okay, top of five. Okay. Mm -hmm. Third bullet point. Mm -hmm. Uh, third bullet, so you're on page five, middle school, and yeah. under the summary The third bullet results. point starts continue professional development, but the second sub-bullet is how to address the needs. I'm in Tuttle, right? Yeah. Mm 
I'm not still finding it. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. at the top of page five, there's a bullet point, the third bullet, the third black bullet point down that says continue professional development. And then the second sub bullet point under that says how to address the needs of students who are experiencing difficulties in the general education setting without additional support. You seeing it? Uh, Am I yeah. blind on my pages? Because I have pages and on the five and I'm I don't have the pages, it. but. Um, <laughs> well, and these pages are not numbered, yeah. but yes. Yeah, yeah, here it is right here. You found it. Oh. Yeah, I was on hanging on five. I'm sorry that they're not. So, no. No, so it's under the under this Goals. here. Mm -hmm. And this is what he's mentioned here. And perhaps the answer is we're just addressing this by having more special educators, by having more professional development, but I mean, kids with these types of issues are always going to need breakout space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, the nice part of this is, um, again, what we're wanting to accomplish, providing professional development to ensure that we're able to respond to individuals with, that are exhibiting these stressors, right? And so having people that are able to do that and having the right spaces to, for them to be able to do that as well. So um, definitely professional development is one of the things we're wanting to accomplish. Um, and then it's, you know, again, part of it is making sure, you know, students are regulated in their behaviors, whether it's mindfulness practices or, um, you know, just uh, supportive approaches. No, I, I think it's a wonderful goal. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be a loss of this type of possibility for students or if this was just a response to the block granting that you talked about from Act 173. Like, how can we keep them in and, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just throw out, I think that it may just be a little bit poorly worded, I'm a special educator. Yeah. And so I think that some students come to your class because they need with additional support. Mm -hmm. Some students might come to your class without, without. it. Mm -hmm. And so what they're saying is like not without That's getting the more. Here. They're saying if a student who has mm -hmm. these issues is coming That's to your class, issue. we need to establish a system without the additional support. And, and professional staffing. So when that student who doesn't come with the support, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, available to them. It's just kind of like a Missing okay. Mm -hmm. Because some students do come with support. Okay. I follow. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. Thanks, Noah. I had a question in some of the elementary school ones where it says that, um, for example, let's see, the Rick Marcotte one, for example. Um, and it was in a couple of the elementary school ones, says that um, there was a problem with engagement, particularly in the identified subgroups. And when we're saying subgroups in here, it seems the list is always inclusive of students with an IEP, free and reduced lunch, and English language learners. So all of those groups. And it says that there's a problem, like, with engagement, and I'm looking now, I didn't mark it down, I wrote down the, the quote, which was some traditional classroom practices do not engage all learners, especially students in the identified subgroups. And I was struggling with that kind of a broad statement because how are we tracking that? You know, how are we tracking that it's not engaging these particular <coughs> sub, like the, these practices aren't engaging those particular subgroups other than sort of anecdotally or you know sort of qualitatively I, I'm just struggling with what that what would lead to a statement like that and and how we would sort of validate that as as a a, a need for focus yeah, I mean I think it's the you know we'd have to be able to we'll give you a little bit more of the the data that supports that right from the perspective of outcomes for students and those related subgroups. You're in the identified problem of practice. You're on the second page. Yeah. 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 But what I'm, yeah, what I'm struggling with is that you know, there are there are SBAC data, of course, and we keep falling back to that well, SBAC not, data. But that doesn't really talk thing. about engagement. That doesn't talk about you know how engaged students are. And that's why I'm struggling. It just feels like when it comes to MTSS, I feel a little bit at sea sometimes mm -hmm. because I'm not deeply in the building every day. And this is sort of an umbrella for a huge number of different initiatives. And I sort of feel like 
our attention is asked to refocus all the time. Like, you know, this year it's on this, this year it's on that. And it's hard for me to understand um, how things are rising to the surface and how a specific thing like engagement, for example, or perseverance is becoming the thing that we're focusing on this year, you know, or um, that's what I'm struggling with a little bit in interpreting these. Yeah, I, I mean, I recognize that, and you brought this up before, you know, that some of the initiatives that we have going on, right, or is it a, a new initiative or piling on initiatives, mm -hmm. but what we know is that, and again, you know this all too, that in order for kids to be available to, to learn, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that they're comfortable and that they're in a space that allows them to feel um, available to learn. And so whether they're coming to us with whatever disposition, it's important for us to understand around diversity, equity, and inclusion enough as experts. It's important for us to understand you know, positive behaviors and supports for them. It's important for us to be mindful of the places that they come as kind of the functional foundation for learning, right? If we walk into a place and we're uncomfortable with us, with where we are, and don't feel welcomed, we're less likely to speak up, we're less likely to, to move about, we're nervous when we are asked to move about because we don't have that sense of belonging. And so that, you know, these kind of these, what are often overused as initiatives, are really trying to make sure that it's all, almost like the foundational part of, of, of being, right? It's similar to, to Maslow's hierarchy of need. And so I think that when we more often to say, oh, it's a lopped on thing, but what we know is that students who don't feel the sense of belonging, who feel isolated, we see increased behaviors. We see, you know, a uh, higher level of absenteeism. And so those are some of the things that, you know, we, we recognize we need to get at. And there's some universal um, avenues that we feel are critically important. So people want to say, well, do we really have to do that? Well, it's critical in order for kids to be available. And we, we've definitely recognized the, the importance of that. The next level up, of course, is then getting into the content. And, but in order to get to the content and make that as um, you know, age appropriate and, and, um, appropriate, or, and strong for them, we've got to make sure that that foundation's there. So we, you, you hear, you'll hear a lot of that, particularly around some of the, the, the wellness and the social emotional component. So, and I'm not dismissive of that at all. And you know, I've spoken up about that a few times myself, especially you know, kids from trauma backgrounds or younger kids. And you know, for a lot of reasons, the social emotional pieces are very important. What I struggle with is that time and budget are finite resources. You know, we we can't they're not we can't just keep expanding them. And my question is how we prioritize. And it's hard for me to read these documents as as not being you know an educator and really. Yeah, what's it going to look like in the building, right? able to weigh in right? or have an opinion on whether this really kind of gets us where we're hoping to go in terms of the ends. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why – that's so mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that I'm I'm saying we shouldn't be doing other things. I'm just struggling with, yeah. like, what kind of feedback I can give you mm -hmm. yeah. Fair. on them. Um, yeah, one I question I did have is that we got these in hard copy – and it seems like there are a lot of sort of linked documents yep. that, we can get um, that like provide, you know, it would be great to be able to click on, you know, sure. what a data wall agenda looks like and, mm -hmm. and sort of try to just understand a little piece of, of what's going into these because it feels like there's a ton of information that's going into them that I've just not seen before. Fair. I can get you that. Money and them being limited, um, it is on the district-wide continuous improvement plan on page three. Uh, the question is, what change can we make that will result in improvement? And the fourth bullet point suggests extended day in school year to provide extra direct instruction to students failing to attain proficiency and for EL students. And I wondered how that would work and what that meant. Yeah, so um, we want to be careful. Like, you know, that's not something that's often popular, but what we know is that we struggle sometimes when we take students to provide them the service that they need, they, they have to lose something, right? So in order to provide them with something, you have to lose something. So in order to go to get a support, you know, you have to not be available. So trying to be really mindful of the day and how those structures are laid out for students. Again, when I'm asked to go singularly leave the room, again, with a support person, a lovely paraeducator, I'm losing out on some, some other 
important component. So the idea is to create that kind of more specialized instructional component for some of our students and to be able to recognize how we can most help them. Reading recovery is a little bit of an example of that for some of you who know. It's a very intense one-on-one -on -one process with a very, very skilled um, and, you know, highly trained individual who can recognize from eye scan to, you know, letter sounds, watching what you're doing, watching how you're approaching it, all kinds of strategies. So that's an example of, but that's, in order for that to work, you've got to take them out of the class, you know, they've got to be out of somewhere. So this idea of having some different structures around time uh, for that to happen uh, is, is important. The other, another example would be, like with schools out, this past, these past years we've run summer school and schools out together, right, combined opportunity. Um, and there's some pieces of school out where kids are going to do just reading and some of the kids are getting specialized instruction during that period. Seamless to the student. We're all going doing a specialized piece. You happen to go to get specialized instruction in reading. Not everybody knows that, right? So there's some of those examples of, of that schedule that we think can, can be important. Yeah, just heard extended day or extended year, and I thought of all sorts of you know, union questions and how, yeah, yeah. how does that work? Right, and so you'd have to have you know, contractual conversations that would obviously have to you know, build into you know, um, all of the positions that we have and, and look at that. But um, again, a lot of the things that we do in professional development you know, is fragmented now. Like AOE has a fair amount of requirements that we need X amount of teachers to go on this day to this location, and it's a disruption, right? And so can, can that model be better organized in some way? So, so this... <clears throat> I, I hadn't quite caught that. I mean, this goes back to a question that I asked Stuart, I think, five years in a row once we started proficiency-based mm -hmm. uh, graduation requirements was what happens if somebody's not proficient mm -hmm. and have we budgeted or figured out how much that's going to cost if we're, our goal is to have everybody leave the school being proficient mm -hmm. either that or we drop our standards for proficiency mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. it's nice keep, to see that we are really long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right it's nice to see that we're now seeing that we might have to spend some more money to keep kids longer uh, in the summertime and I mean, the, the goal would be that we that we still have get a design the system time, and flexible pathways and personalized learning plans allow that to be successful but on and again we have a good number of students that Need some additional. Yeah, no, time. no. I, I've always yeah. thought that that was the case, and I never really got yeah. mm -hmm. comfort that we, in fact, recognize that. Well, and I think that question goes to something interesting in the high school part of it. Um, where on page three, the last bullet says that our goal is to establish and implement universal expectations for redos, retakes, and reassessment. Mm -hmm. And I wondered how that was related to page five, where in measures we talk about the analysis of the disconnect between academic grades and performance-based graduation requirements. I mean, to me, the idea that you can have these retakes or redos or without any penalty, now maybe I misunderstand it, but it seems like my son on occasion just sort of phones it in, takes a test, bombs it, and realizes you can retake it without penalty, you know? And so I wonder if that's where some of the divergence is coming from. No, I don't, that's not the over the arch, overarching goal here is to ensure that you know proficiencies are proficient. Students are becoming proficient, yeah. and what we know in the in the more old you know the the past structured way is that you take a test, you get in the, you get a you get a a grade, and that's it, and you move on. And so you your course completion is you know I'm going to just say a D. Well, it didn't mean you didn't attain the material. So the opportunity in a learning environment is to make sure that we're providing you with, with the level of instruction and feedback that allows you to, to be proficient and, and to, to, to be successful. Um, otherwise, we pass kids on that are, you know, it's really unsatisfactorily understanding, but they're able, you know, they're still graduating, right? So as we make this transition, we want to be sensitive to, again, motivation is an important component. I mean, we definitely know that motivation and relevance in the content area is important. Our hope is, is that's, that's there. And if it's there and you have a willingness and we can provide you with the relevance and you get the proficiency, that's what we want. So we don't want to say, that's it, that's all, you're done. You know, I certainly agree everything. with that. But yeah, the question of redos and retakes, I assume to have a different test would put a great onus on the teacher and therefore the kid, when he takes it a second or third time, is seeing much the same kind of material, right? Right, so I mean, it, it may, the, the delivery of how that assessment might be done may, may be in a test form, it may be in, in, in a different format maybe demonstrating their proficiency in a, in a different way. But that's part of that 
you know, their ability to, to demonstrate their level of proficiency. Again, I think there's definitely a load, you know, on our, on, our, on our teacher to be able to identify that. But again, that's part of what we think is really critically important for that learning outcome. And from what I've seen, like students can't take a test and then bomb it and then take a test second time and then get at 100%. Like that, there are some penalties that are involved right. depending on which teacher, depending on what You've got to put forth an e right, some right. effort. And so, so it's not just an automatic A, just, oh, great, you redid it. But you have to we, show that you've learned the work. And right, and we, and we want kids to, to know that, you know, when you take an assessment, it's important reflection of your work. And it shouldn't be... I'm, I'm tired, I'm just not going to do it, you know, so there's, there's a sense of responsibility we're trying to also make sure it's happening, and so that's built into that. Right. So good, good, good questions, though. I appreciate the feedback. All right. We will move further discussion to the next yep. meeting. Thanks. Uh, if we move on to agenda item 10, uh, we've got a school board meeting location and schedule. I noticed the location <laughs> isn't is changing. pretty consistent. It's <laughs> all the same school. That's not because we don't think you guys know the directions. <laughs> you know, I, that could be one past member from so, way back. But. So is that meant to be? Yeah, it is. And part, of the, part of the reason, and I think we can talk about how we want to do this in the future, but our buildings currently... Um, we do stream live quite regularly, and that's been pretty popular for people. We've got a lot of followers that are on, but our, uh, our other elementary schools can't do it. You really can't stream live. And so, um, again, we just we feel like it's a, the it's a right thing. If we want to schedule some times to do other outreach or a retreat mm -hmm. time or something like that or to see a certain event, you know, that might be a, a better way for us to, to get out and have some exposure. Or, or to invite in, you know, to invite in, mm -hmm. you know, Orchard or Rick Marcotte or Chamberlain folks in for presentation, a share, what have you. Typically, our attendance, you know, has been, you know, not not so great in the in, in the environment. We're not drawing people, and we're not really seeing what's happening yeah, in the school. That's I right. I mean, we see the room that we're sitting in. Right. The other thing is, we've had some feedback that you know, people who are frustrated with a decision that we made at one of those meetings that's in a different location. They didn't know. We get accused that we we're moved moving them around. it. Yeah. We moved it around on purpose, which is not the intent at all. It was that's to right. do community outreach, but it's confusing for it, people who only right. attend things that they're. <coughs> we think that it, it will help, but I mean, I do feel like you know, I got to reach out to the. You know, and we want to be careful about how much we do this, but it's nice to get some showcasing so if, at times. If yeah? there's more than <coughs> if there's more than four people live watching the live stream, we're doing better by staying here than yeah. going to those other schools. No, we never get more than four people. At, I know. At, Richard, at, do you, are you live streaming tonight? And do you know how <laughs> how many we have on? You can't tell right now, right? I know the station can, but yeah. Okay, so any other feedback on the schedule yeah. itself? So we have July 10th mm -hmm. as a very, uh, probably what I assume is a very abbreviated meeting mm -hmm. to approve new hires AP orders only. Mm -hmm. um, I can call into that meeting. Do you anticipate it to be less than a half hour? Oh, it's hard for me to, to so say that, but I, generally it's we, a fairly short. We should just short. find out who's going to be here because that one we really just need a quorum because mm -hmm. we don't. I'm going to be here. I, I will it. weirdly be here because soccer tryouts are that night, so I have to come back from vacation Martin, for soccer tryouts. Bridget. <laughs> so no. three of us Brian. will be here, yeah. so okay. you don't have to worry All right. about that. Now, August 7th, I will not be here. I don't know that yeah. that matters um, if we're just sticking with our you know, first and third. I just wanted to make sure, again, that we have quorum because it's that tricky time of year. Yep. But I will. that's also potentially a travel day, so it's one of those ones that I might not be able to call no into. Mm -hmm. um, so so, I'll, so yeah, I'm here on the 7th, but not on the 21st, <laughs> which is another... So it would be good, um, I don't know, it would be good if, if you folks could just take a look at it and do mm -hmm. either yeses, noes, mm -hmm. and we can at least put those together yeah. because there may be some times where we've got more than, you know, three of three of you out and we can't, and we're going to have to move mm -hmm. the meeting or it may I'm not be. here November 20th either. I've given her my, my nose. Thank you. Thank you. We know this, we know this feedback on the dates, so we ensure we have a quorum. Yeah, thanks. All right. Yeah. Do you want me here for the summer dates? <laughs> because I can't. Always love I the <laughs> No. no. <laughs> I think cool if you look at the agenda um, and you get an idea of what the topics are, or at least maybe have a discussion with David or I about, you know, selective attendance. I think that's more than adequate. Okay. 
because I'd be happy to come. I just want to. Yeah, and I think you know, like tonight, you know, important (coughs) opportunity to provide feedback. You may see some things that are really important, and you want to make sure you're here. You're welcome every time. But we also know that. And we'll we'll do the same of look ahead at the agendas and make sure Mm -hmm. you know if there's an important topic. Okay. All right, uh, agenda item 11, district policy review on drug and alcohol testing for transportation employees. It's a first reading. Did, did we need to take action on the uh, schedule, though? Oh, yeah, uh, we yes, we do. So uh, can I'll I have a motion? that we approve the schedule for the school board for meeting dates for 2019-2020. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Motion passes. Mm-hmm. A district policy review again? Yeah, so mm-hmm. what this reflects, it's, you, you'll see that it's uh, heavily sh- um, redacted. <laughs> um, and so this um, now um, is consistent with the, with the VSBA model policy. And, you know, again, those have been vetted by uh, attorneys. And basically, um, in this particular case, less is better um, than all of the other oh. components. So, again, first reading. Certainly open for any feedback or questions you might have. That's where we are with that. All right. Mm -hmm. So we we took agenda item 12 off. Mm -hmm. So agenda item 13, negotiations update. I think the brief update is we're scheduled for fact-finding on July 9th, and we just need to get some details on time Mm -hmm. and place, I believe. Mm -hmm. And how many of us do you want there or not? Because I could potentially be there mm-hmm. or not. I would have to stretch just a little to do it, but I could do it if, if you needed me there. So I didn't know what your thought was. Um, I think we should probably just have that discussion at On Monday, a working session and uh, figure out who can be there and <coughs> what the agenda looks like. And it may be impacted by the time of day, too. I, did, I don't know if we had a specific time. Okay. Yeah. Later is better for me if that impacts it at all, mm-hmm. um, only because I would be coming back from Massachusetts. And if it's early in the morning, I'll have to drive back the night before. Yeah. If it's in the afternoon, I could do it in the morning. But All right. Okay. Agenda item 14, other paper articles. i to find it. I got it here. No, mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. You help me out. So um, let's see. We've got, um, forgetting where we are. So we, uh, do we have the dates for? We don't look like we do. Um, we need the dates for. Yeah, right now we months. don't. Okay. Um, so we can, but again. Sorry, this question of whether we were going to do them in the summer. That's right, because you hadn't in the past, oh, okay. but we kind of. Well, of the topics that we have here, um, is there any board feedback on what would be critical to make sure we do, even if it is during the summer? I think master planning and visioning would be a good thing to update people. We mm-hmm. just made a pretty big mm-hmm. step in yeah. that process. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, the specialization one's tricky because I do think parents want to hear from the district. I don't know that a board column is the appropriate mm-hmm. venue for mm-hmm. it because yep. it really needs to come from the administration and yep. directly to parents. I don't think us getting in the middle of that is appropriate. Um, 180 Market Street might be a good article for the end of the summer, um, basically to let parents know what to expect mm-hmm. as they come back uh, from the summer. Um, so I, th- I do think those those two, Master Planning and Vision and 180 Market Street, are, are important to have in there. Mm-hmm. And then we are going to need another negotiations update at some point, but that might be fall. Um, that might be sort of after um, after fact-finding. So, so if I look at this, it looks like we should try to get the June date for Master Planning and Visioning mm-hmm. and the August date for 180 Market. Mm-hmm. So we'd have July off. So can we get those dates when the article is due then? Um, The only thing is that the 180 Market Street one probably should be written in July for that first issue in August, if if, if we're still on the same schedule of writing it for the last Thursday to be published the the first Thursday of the month. Because if it's published the first Thursday of September, we're already back into school. So that one really should be written in July, unfortunately. Yeah, so written in July, out in August on the Market Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So... Uh, so basically, we'd end up taking August off then. 
the one that's written in August written for August, the okay. first opening. So of if school. we could make sure we let the other paper know that, um, I can take the 180 Market Street um, volunteers for master planning and visioning. I'm happy to take master planning and visioning. That's fine. I know, but it's also it it what would take me. 20 minutes to write would take somebody oh, okay. else <laughs> longer to write. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to do that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So that would be the one that would be due then probably in like three weeks or two or three weeks. Yeah. So if we can get those dates and then mm -hmm. republish that, that mm -hmm. would be great. Any other comments or we should be put that on a, on an agenda before it's mm -hmm. get into the fall due dates. Yeah. So we can do that. All right. Agenda item 15, setting the agenda for June 19th. Okay, we just pulled a few things forward. Yeah. So we're going to do some school bus info. Mm -hmm. I'm just, that won't be the exact title of that, but school bus and policy mm -hmm. update. We're going to do two, one. and 2.1. Yeah. We're going to bring CIP back. Mm -hmm. Um Help me out. What else did we say? We come back. I think that was all right. I think that was it. Yeah. I'm, I will not be there for that meeting, so the student rep report. Well, okay. Yeah. I'm not going to be there either. For Thank that you, Cole. Okay. So okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Just, yeah so this we're all on the now, right? <laughs> That's so. right. <laughs> we weren't sure which Thank way you. we were going to go. So. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Future mm -hmm. agenda items. I haven't done anything since the last meeting on these. So again, I still want to let you know that we'll, we're working <coughs> this into the which ones are there. And, all right, so hopefully we can get some dates or where these are embedded in policy. Yeah. All right. Uh, agenda item 17, consider the meeting minutes of May 13. <clears throat> Any changes or modifications? Nope. Corrections? May 15. On page 5. Mm -hmm. Where it says below, where it says bid. Would it be better where it says Bridget Burkhart announced, would it be better to say that um, the consent agenda was approved by consensus or something? Is, is that the, let me, let me just put this out there. Is that the way we want to word it? I think, it's, I think it's, it just reflects what I said in the meeting. Right. I think yeah. I looked up and said, then if there are no other comments, then the consent right. agenda is approved. I think it's just reflecting like what we've said in the meetings. That's typically how right. Elizabeth mm -hmm. does it, okay. too. So, yeah, yeah, it's consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. May 20th. May 24th. And May 28th. All right. Oh, fine. Seeing no changes, though, those are approved by consensus. Wait, wait one second. Oh, okay. I was not there on May 28th. Ah. May 28th. Actually, I should check the one I was not at. Mm. Which one? The you were. Yeah, you love that meeting. Yeah. yeah. The 28th. You so should be on there. Me out for you. Yep. Huh. Okay. Huh. Hmm. Good catch. All right. Good hmm. catch. All right. The consent agenda. Um, do I need to take that off? Can. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to take one thing off the consent agenda. It's on the uh, new hire of Katie McCabe. <coughs> we can just take that off. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, 
there is also a leave of absence, and I did not see any details on that. I'm okay, you know, trusting administration with that, but normally we see these requests. Yeah, so what this is is a leave of absence from the classroom with the, with the desire to take a, take a different position in special education. Mm -hmm. So this was a request that, that a classroom teacher has had to pursue some additions, you know, to, to try her and she's currently certified and mm -hmm. special educator, so that's the that's the okay. Again, same school. Yep. So mm -hmm. again, that's why that's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I'm trying to provide some clarity to the to the act. You know what's happening. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Um, and the the specific individual I took off, no reflection on the individual at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I did have a question about. Uh, the assignment looks like it's a one-year assignment, <coughs> and it's a. F uh, I've got to go through my packet, and it's a fairly significant mm -hmm. um, difference between budget and salary. So I just wanted to get some details on mm -hmm. uh, the circumstances there. So again, uh, we do have hiring guidelines, um, and I think if you go through it, you'll see some, you know, some mm -hmm. variability there. Um, this one certainly is above the hiring guidelines, but um, this is a high school position, um, and the candidate pool and the things that they were looking for. This was a really, really important fit for the for the high school, and um, so um, that's why the position is there. The one year leave is that the position in which this is opened is uh, a result of uh, a teacher that was <coughs> has request previously requested a one-year leave so um, that's why it's worded that way so this this truly is a one-year it truly assignment. is a one-year okay. yes because mm -hmm. the person who's requested the one-year leave is <coughs> the contract holder has the opportunity to return yeah and changes that's the, and that's why the budget is so much lower because that person who's on leave yeah. has a lower salary than the person that that's you're right. filling in. Okay. That's right. And, you know, this is an example of, um, you know, individuals who come to us with some um, other experiences in their life and or other degrees in their, in their before they have rendered and come to the world of education. Yeah. And, yeah. Thanks for the mm -hmm. additional info. Yeah. You're welcome. All right, uh, agenda 19, we have three AP orders, 42, 43, and 44. Any questions? So, you didn't really take that teacher off of the... Yeah, off the consent. Off the consent, you just asked All a question favor. about it. Yeah. Because so if, you took, if you took take, her off, if you took her off, we should really have yeah. to So you need to on vote it. on that one particular, oh. the one that you took off. Well, we don't take action on the consent. Right, so you don't have to do but consent, you take but you it took off, it off. Unless you, you, you can ask a question about something on the consent agenda without taking it off. That You only take it off oh, if you I think you I might have been vote. using our old practice when we had to take action on the consent agenda. Right. So, all right, so I'll retract that. I'm not, I did not. You just take, had a question. You did, yeah. You had a question want, on the consent agenda. You on this one person. Got it. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I think I wasn't sure. I'd asked the question previously, and I wasn't sure you yeah. would be prepared to answer That's it. That's so fair. That you had a question. might have resulted in that. but um, Okay, so we'll reverse that. Yeah. <laughs> Agenda item 19. Three APRs. Any questions? Yeah, number 44, page 3. I just was curious what combined services LLC is with the health reimbursement arrangement. I didn't understand what that was. Number one nine eight four nine, I guess. That's why number forty three. Yeah, this is on forty four, I believe. Okay. Forty three, Brian. Oh God, help me. Uh, I just said forty four. Forty four. Sorry. That's wrong. Page what? Page three of seventeen. Did you mm -hmm. look at what? Three of seventeen. So it says. Yeah. How far down? It's um about two thirds of the way down. The number is one nine eight four nine. Yeah, just obviously the total jumped out for 173 grand. I didn't know what this health reimbursement Page three of four. Is. Page three of HR. 17. Yeah. I'm on the wrong one. <laughs> I can share with you. Yeah. Well, it's kind of back, it's kind of put together backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's a little yeah, bit no, I'm, I'm confusing. A, yeah, I'm a, 
Um, the HRA is is um, the reimbursement right. of teachers and Helps. support staff, basically all district health care insurance. So um, it's basically the provider of the the uh, administrative services. Right. We have to write a check to our administrator to fund yeah. um, out of pocket expenses and. Well, Gary, expenses. isn't this CS one? CS one. This That's is right. CS one, the TPA for. That's yes. right. It's it the used third to be party administrator for yeah, data the data health care plan. So third party administrator it takes in all the claims that come in from teachers for yeah. pharmacy and medical and all of that. Mm -hmm. They basically are sort of sit in between us and the money that goes back out to teachers. That's, that's and these are the folks teachers. that you were referring to earlier. So you see well? H. So you see so these, this is the good one so far. Well, better, better than better. than data path no or. But you see, uh, again, it's better. a good it's a good better. question though. But it's the, you see the HRA, the FSA, mm -hmm. and you see the the, the service fee you know, broken out there for them. Okay. Yeah, there used to it be, would be good big if it blue had cross a combination blue shield of ones on C here that, that were all just one. sort of, it's just payments so, on the health care. So, Gary, for purposes of um, just kind of education, where, what would the vendor for premiums would be? Um, VHI or Blue Cross Blue Shield directly? That's an excellent question. I think it's a v it's a v high. You would see the payment for premium. That would be my thought too. But it's ultimately Blue Cross Blue Shield. It gets to but Blue that Cross would be a, that would be separate, Brian, than the HRA. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> you did see that the legislature is going has told the Department of Financial Regulation to regulate third party providers. I've not seen them. Yeah. Great. <laughs> mm. Yeah. All right. You saw that? I did. Yeah. Do I, was, I, I was happy to vote for that one. A motion to adjourn. I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Okay. Thank you, everybody.